This is Thomas Wayne Riley, and you have found yourself in the American Southwest. In consideration and appreciation of your personal quality and merits, and of the services that you rendered for twenty years in the war against the Chichimecan Indians of the kingdoms of Nueva Galicia and Nueva Vizcaya, I appoint you as my governor, Captain General, Caudillo, Discoverer, and pacifier of the provinces of New Mexico and those adjacent and neighboring. Don Philip, King of Spain, Portugal, Naples, and Sicily, to future Adelantado, Don Juan de Oñate. By the mid-1500s, the Spanish colonial empire was enormous and powerful. It sprawled from the southern tip of South America to the northern mountains and deserts of Mexico. Parts of the Mediterranean, Italy, and southern France were under Spanish domain. They'd explored parts of California. They'd sailed through Maine and into the New York Harbor. They'd landed at the Philippine Islands. The Spanish claimed Florida, Cuba, Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, and more in the Caribbean. The Incas were no more. The Aztecs were destroyed. There were islands in the Atlantic under Spanish control and there was nothing stopping the military and naval powerhouse that was the richest kingdom on earth at the time. No other European power would rival Spain's territory until Napoleon. It seemed they were the first kingdom to be able to say the sun never set on their empire. But there was just one more place they needed to go, just one more blank spot on the map that had yet to be conquered or really even explored by Europeans, but more importantly, the Spanish. That place was obviously the American Southwest. In reality, out of the entire Spanish empire of Central America, no land was more difficult to get to from its capital, Mexico City, than Santa Fe. It was one of the farthest reaches in all of the Spanish empire, period. To get there from DF or Mexico City, it would take six months and over 2,000 miles of harsh travel through rugged, thorny, hot, dangerous to life and limb terrain. To send a letter from Santa Fe to the capital of New Spain and then expect a response would take a year. Madrid? Forget about it. That was considerably longer. It's no wonder, then, that the colony experienced the turbulent and seemingly lawless period of time between contact and the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, but especially after the conquest of 1598. Those 80 years or so would prove to be tough for both the conquering settlers and the conquered Puebloans, as abuse, civil unrest, murders, fear, starvation, plundering, and worse were rife throughout the land. As the late author and adventurer David Roberts, in his fantastic book, titled Cleverly and Conveniently for Us, The Pueblo Revolt, The Secret Rebellion That Drove the Spaniards Out of the Southwest, in that book, Roberts says this of New Mexico before the revolt. As Castile preoccupied itself with threats and troubles nearer home, the remote colony luxuriated in an anarchic autonomy that spawned grotesque abuses. Settlers routinely ignored Spanish laws promulgated since the 1570s to protect natives from the excesses of the first conquistadors. More than one governor of New Mexico set himself up as an absolute despot, growing rich off the labor of Indians reduced to virtual slavery. More than one friar in the colony arrogated to himself the right to punish native heresies with torture and execution. Sexual exploitation of prevalent women, including rape, was commonplace, even on the part of priests sworn to celibacy. As if all this weren't not burden enough for the Pueblos, for 82 years after the conquest, church and state in New Mexico waged a relentless struggle against each other. There was no possible way for a good Indian to serve both masters. End quote. And that is essentially what this episode is about. But of course, in typical the American Southwest fashion, we start well before the conquest. In 
Before I even play the intro music, though, I do have to say, for the Pueblo Revolt, it was surprisingly difficult to find sources. I kind of assumed that the Pueblo Revolt, the major recorded incident in the American Southwest, at least among the Native Americans and the Spanish, and the, the event that truly changed the trajectory of not only the Southwest, but the trajectory of all of the North American continent. I had assumed that there would have been more scholarly or historical sources for it. I mean, the Pueblo Revolt resulted in the Puebloans, Apaches, Comanches, and very shortly the Crow and Blackfeet, as well as a bevy of other tribes, obtaining and utilizing with extreme intelligence, bravado, cunning, and lethality, they would obtain the horse. One could argue the Apache had already stolen a few from Mexico, but for the area that would become the United States, the Indians greatly benefited from the Pueblo Revolt's freeing of the horse, as well as other technologies. If you think about it, the Indian that pop culture brings to your mind, whether it's correct and or PC or not, But the image of the horseback riding, feather headdress wearing, buffalo hunting, stoic, noble figure is only possible because the Native Americans received the horse from the Pueblo Revolt. And then, before long, wild horses roamed freely around a continent that birthed their evolution in the first place. It's almost as if the horses came back to their own promised land. And once set free among the infinite grasslands of the American Great Plains and West... They flourished, and they and their various riders went on to become the enduring symbols of the American West. Without horses, the Plains tribes wouldn't have been able to wage the war that they did in the 1800s that I talked about in my Buffalo Soldiers episodes. There would have been no Buffalo Soldiers at all. I had a professor once describe the Indians getting the horse as equivalent to the Soviets gaining the atomic bomb. Up until then, America had the monopoly on its world-ending power. Once the Soviets had it, the playing field was leveled. For a time, at least. So the Pueblo Revolt and the freeing of technology, sheep and other livestock, and most importantly, horses, had a profound impact on the North American continent. But then there's the sweet taste of freedom the Puebloans would feel that no other peoples in the Americas would feel anywhere else. They beat their conquerors, and for a short while, they secured freedoms that seemed unimaginable to the countless other tribes and peoples of the Americas. That's why the Pueblo Revolt of 1680 is so important. That's why I wanted to cover it so badly. But of course, I had to set it up first, hence the previous eight episodes over the amazing and awe-inspiring ancient ones, of the American Southwest, who would become these very storied Puebloans we're going to talk about in this episode. But even despite that importance, there are very few sources for this monumental topic. Besides David Roberts' The Pueblo Revolt, there's the University of Oklahoma Press, but the 1995 OU Press book by Andrew L. Knott titled The Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Conquest and Resistance in 17th Century New Mexico, which, oddly enough, I bought a signed copy of from a bookstore in Milwaukee on a date, one of the first dates with my with my wife, almost two years before this episode is going to air. It was months before I even dreamt up this podcast. Well, I just wanted to learn about the revolt. But beyond that book from Knott uh, and Roberts, There was only one other publication that I relied heavily upon, and that was John Kessel's 1978 Kiva Cross and Crown. Thankfully, I would find some other articles and research papers that helped, but I consistently ran into inaccuracies. A brand new book I will not name, but one that I was very excited to read, and a book which covers the indigenous perspective of the founding of the various American nations, well... I only read the parts pertaining to the American Southwest and the Pueblo Revolt, and it was consistently wrong, just flat-out inaccurate and incorrect. Thankfully, I was able to return it, but, you know, shame on those writers for getting basic information wrong. I make zero money so far from this podcast, 
but I try and make sure everything I say is factually correct. Or if I'm guessing, I say so at least. So because of that, I only quote from a few authors on this one. That being said, the difficulty in sources does make sense if you remember the Pueblo Mystique I have mentioned so many times by now, and in so many other previous episodes. But not just Pueblo Mystique. You've got to remember the centuries of important society-altering changes and events, aka fault lines. And those fault lines lend themselves to Pueblo Mystique, kind of like the Civil War and those migrations we've talked so much about. I even talked about that in the last episode's intro. But you've also got to understand the secretive ways of the Puebloans themselves, which, again, lends itself to Pueblo Mystique. And you've got to understand the exaggerated, sometimes exaggerated, and sometimes incorrect recordings of the Spanish chroniclers. Sure, I do imagine a lot of the time they're telling the truth, but a lot of the times those who are recording these histories were not even present for the events they are writing about. And finally, you've got to rely on the English translations of those Spanish documents. And that's some of them are old Spanish. That's like reading old English, but imagine it's not even English, it's Spanish. All of this combines into an incredibly difficult setting of historical unknowns that is the Pueblo Revolution. And to perfectly sum up all that I just said, here is Andy Knott in his Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Modern-day ethnographers are forced to contend with the fact that centuries of intervening history have clouded the collective Pueblo memory of the early years of contact with European intruders, distorting to an undeterminable degree the folk tales and ceremonial practices handed down from generation to generation. At the same time, the documentary record for early colonial New Mexico reflects all too faithfully the biases of Spanish observers, rarely concerned with conveying an accurate sense of the lives of their Pueblo vassals. Compounding the problems of relying on this type of evidence, many of the documents generated in New Mexico during the 17th century burned in the revolt itself. As Pueblos, eager to erase all vestiges of the Spanish presence in their land, torch mission chapter houses across the province and the government archive in Santa Fe. End quote. Interestingly, and quite tantalizingly, in terms of them records being burned by the Puebloans during the revolt, in Robert's other oft-cited book by me, uh, that book being The Lost World of the Old Ones, Robert says, quote, Recently, Bill Watley, the Anglo who serves as Jemez tribal archaeologist, startled me with a revelation. The Pueblos themselves, he said, still keep and guard Spanish documents from the 17th century, seized during the Pueblo Revolt. Not everything was destroyed in 1680, he pointed out. Scholars would give much to see these records. End quote. So, maybe one day researchers will know more when the Puebloans themselves are more willing to give up their documents and sources. If that claim is even true. Remember, that was a white man saying that tidbit of information about stored away Spanish documents. But until the day the Puebloans open their vaults, which... Let's be honest, it's been almost 350 years, so don't hold your breath. And probably they shouldn't. They certainly don't have to. But because of all that, it is startlingly difficult to get to the bottom of anything Puebloan related. In Robert's Pueblo Revolt, he says of that difficulty of fact-finding, quote, Pursuing my research on the Pueblo Revolt, I read everything I could get my hands on, from the eyewitness Spanish accounts to modern histories of New Mexico to archaeological site reports to the many scholarly articles about the revolt, as well as a novel based upon it, published in 1973, under the by now very un-PC title Red Power on the Rio Grande. I also visited today's Pueblos and spoke to as many Puebloans as I could. Not very many, as I was hardly surprised to discover, who were willing to share their thoughts about the revolt with an outsider. End quote. Speaking with Native Americans, especially Puebloans, it turns out is quite difficult indeed. 
I have found that despite my enthusiasm for the topics of the Pueblos and the their ancestors and the history and their current residents, I have found that I am not trusted or even really cared for on Resland or on Mesa Tops or anywhere near ancestral homes. I can't blame my American Indian neighbors, though. At the same time, it can be a little frustrating. And that is all I'll say of that. Because this episode is filled with a whole bunch of Europeans who travel to the Southwest only to get frustrated with the native populations and take it out in uh, unfortunate ways. But as the episode title suggests, and the intro by Roberts goes into, the Puebloans get their revenge. At least, for a time. Instead of this episode being about the Pueblo Revolt, though, actually, this episode ended up growing in length to be Dan Carlin-esque. So I had to split it into two. And this episode won't even go into the revolt. But this one's going to start 150 years before, and it will cover the Spanish exploration and colonization of New Mexico, before talking about the governors, church leaders, and Puebloans as the revolt approaches, and how they and their actions shape the coming explosion of Puebloan frustration. There's a lot to cover. So, let's start exploring the American Southwest. There once was a man that I called Stephen in my second ever episode, when I very briefly covered his interesting life. And it's kind of a crime that I only briefly covered his life, because it was pretty exciting. But that man that I called Stephen in my episode over black explorers in the American Southwest, Stephen became a rather famous, or infamous, man in the Puebloan world some 500 years ago. Although, the people of his time, and even the Puebloan people now, would not have and do not call him Stephen, but rather Esteban de Durantes, and he was among the first Spaniards to set foot in the Puebloan world. Okay, so Esteban was not a Spaniard, but rather he was a black Moroccan Moor, and he had been captured by the Portuguese and sold into slavery. But Esteban became the first non-native person to meet the indigenous Puebloan Indians of the American Southwest. And that was his second foray into the Southwest. His first time in the area actually made he and his group the first people from across the ocean to travel through the American Southwest since probably the end of the Ice Age. And that first trip was quite the adventure. After failing to set up a colony in Florida and then surviving a shipwreck in the Gulf of Mexico on the Texas coast in the year 1528. Esteban and a small band of hardy survivors, led by Cabeza de Vaca, wandered Texas, the Great Plains, southern New Mexico, and possibly even Arizona. During their travels, they met countless Native Americans who they traded and interacted with, and during it all, Esteban was the interpreter. The man learned six or more languages during his travels through North America. He grew quite knowledgeable about the Indian customs and cultures that the group came into contact with. And the Indians even began to see he and his fellow foreign strangers as holy men and healers. And they must have no doubt been quite important. Devaka claimed the Indians believed they were angels from heaven. But regardless of whether that was true or not, the Indians did indeed seem to revere these strange travelers. Especially Esteban, who did most of the communicating 
because apparently the Spaniards wanted to seem more important, so they had him, the black slave, do the talking. It also helped that this Moroccan probably spoke many languages already, including Berber, maybe some Arabic, Spanish, and Portuguese. What's a few more Native American languages? He clearly had the ear for new tongues. So after eight years of wandering, uh, eight years is a long time, and that's an incredible story. But after eight years, they do finally make it to Mexico City, where the weary travelers who'd been wandering through the Americas for eight long years, they finally made it to quote-unquote civilization. And once there, they'd sow the seeds for the future rumor of the seven cities of Cibola with their tall tales of a place where the inhabitants, these strange travelers were told by buffalo hunting natives, but at this city, the, the seven cities, the inhabitants had no use for gold, yet they had so much of it. They had so much of it that they painted their houses with it. The one thing you do not do to the Spanish in the age of exploration is mention gold. But the Indians who had tantalizingly hinted this to the Spanish travelers didn't know this yet. Or maybe they did, and they wanted their northern Puebloan friends to feel some Spanish friendship. That's probably not true, but I don't know. For whatever reason, though, the tribes these travelers came into contact with in southern New Mexico and northern Mexico, and even in West Texas. But these Native Americans told the adventurers of many rich and fat Indians who sit in warmth year-round, surrounded by their cornfields and their gold, and they're just up this here river, the Rio Grande. Unfortunately for Esteban, he was indeed still a slave, and once he returned, he got his butt sold to the viceroy of New Spain himself, one Antonio de Mendoza. And Antonio de Mendoza decided he really needed to get him some of that gold everyone's up in arms about that sits up to the north. So a party was put together, and this party was led by Friar Marcos de Niza, with Esteban serving as interpreter. Pretty quickly, though, Esteban, with his knowledge of culture and language he'd picked up during his eight years of wandering, Esteban would uh, eventually take the lead. Fray Marcos de Niza was no sissy, though. The man had run with Francisco Pizarro during his uh, conquering of Peru and South America. There, more gold than could be looted was scooped up and shipped back to Spain, and Deniza had no doubts that the same fate was waiting for him in the far north that had brightened his life in the far south. But while he may have been no sissy, he definitely had a big mouth. So the group left from Culiacan, a city I have mentioned before, as in the place where the Anasazi may have ended up just before the Spanish arrived. But the group left Culiacan and headed north, and the entire time Esteban was showered with gifts of turquoise and feathers, and it's possible, some women. Obviously, he grew accustomed to this as any red-blooded man traveling through a beautiful foreign land would. But according to history, Estebanico, little Stephen, got a little too demanding. Eventually, the Moor would outpace Deniza and the group, along with some fellow Indian travelers and interpreters. And it's at this point the small group would come across a Zuni Pueblo known as Hawika. Today, Hawika is just ruins that are not allowed to be visited by outsiders, but at the time, it was a considerable Pueblo. But a considerable Pueblo made of mud and straw that just looked golden in the setting sun, but was not made of gold. So Esteban was now in the history books as the first non-native that we know of to visit the Puebloan world of the American Southwest. What happened to Esteban next is up in the air, but the going theory is it did not end well. Everyone in the party that entered the Pueblo made it back to Fray Marcos de Niza, except for the black slave, though. That much we do know. The Spanish account has him kidnapped after declaring the place for Spain, imprisoned without food or water, and then killed, only for the other Indians to barely escape and make it back to Deniza to tell this dramatic story, which, of course, included some arrows being shot their way as they ran. Plausible. Some Zuni stories have him coming to the Pueblo with feathers and rattles, which really pleased the Puebloans, 
But after the man began to demand too much food and too many women, the Zuni killed him. And then they let the other Native Americans go. Another Zuni story was written about in Robert's Pueblo Revolt, but was originally published by a Puebloan archaeologist and ethnographer named Edmund Ladd. In Ladd's account, who again, uh, Ladd is a Zuni Puebloan himself, but he wrote that Esteban approached this city after being asked not to. He crossed a line of maize that was drawn in the sand. Uh, he was eventually allowed in, though, with his um, gifts of rattles and feathers. He then maybe asked for too many things, like food and women, but probably aired during a custom, at which point he was brought before the elders, where Esteban made his fateful mistake. In front of the Pueblo's leaders, he told them that he was in charge of a big group of white men that were coming to conquer them, so they better let him go or else. The Zuni chose the or else, and they killed him. The Pueblo ones at the time, according to Ladd, but the, the Zunis, they would have known very well who the Spanish were and what they were capable of. They'd heard the stories of slave raiding that came almost that far north, which absolutely happened. They probably had sent scouts to witness these slave raiders, and probably sent scouts to witness these men coming up. So they weren't taking any chances. You've got to remember, the Native Americans of the Southwest, and actually all over the Americas, were excellent runners and travelers. Quick tangent warning, but uh, after releasing the episode of the Anasazia migration down south and talking about the Tarumara, I read a quote that basically said what I did at the end of uh, the discussion about them, which was that while the Raramuri are indeed amazing runners, they weren't quote-unquote born to run, at least any more than any other Native American. Well, I said any more than any other human, which is still true. But it's indeed especially true with Native Americans. Here's a quote from 1643, all the way on the other side of the continent, by a man named Roger Williams, who was the founder of Rhode Island. I have known many of them run between four score or a hundred miles in a summer's day. End quote. A score back then is twenty. So he's saying the northeastern Native Americans could run 80 or 100 miles in a single day. To modern ears, that's incredible. Yet, the Indians used to be the greatest travelers in the world, at least at this time. Remember the breakdown of the D4 receptors I talked about last episode? Unfortunately, colonization and assimilation took, took it out of most Native Americans just like I probably took it out of Europeans a long time ago, who no doubt used to also could run four score and a hundred miles. I'm talking like thousands of years ago. So with their ability to travel quickly and for great distances on foot, the Puebloans no doubt were hearing and seeing things that were going on down south with their cousins and neighbors. That makes Esteban declaring that these existential threats were headed this way and that he was an important leader of them not exactly a smart play. There is, though, one final theory I read that says the Kachina figure, Chakwaina, is based off of Esteban, because yet another story has it that he urged the Zuni to help him fake his death so he could be a free man. At which point they obliged him, and they set the other Indians running to tell the Spanish that uh, they had killed him. But in reality, he lived the rest of his life as a native enjoying all the corn and bison and women he could tolerate. There's no way to corroborate this without a time machine, so for now, it's really anyone's guess. I will say, though, that later Puebloans do have residents, uh, like in the 1600s, they do have residents that are descended from black slaves. I'll even talk about one, a Naranjo. Regardless, what happened to Esteban is a fun mystery. But what happened to the rest of the party and Deniza is not a mystery. As soon as Fray Marcos Deniza got back to New Spain after abandoning the adventure, uh, once word had come back to him of Esteban the death, uh, but as soon as he was back in Mexico, aka New Spain, he quickly forgot the truth and not long after his arrival, he was spreading rumors that not only did the Indians savagely kill Esteban, but they did it right there, in their enormous, even larger than Mexico City, shining and shimmering, gold-plated, palatial northern Tenochtitlan, with its golden walls and golden road and golden everything city. <laughs> 
for some reason, possibly by corrupting the Zuni word for bison, which is siwolo. But for some reason, Deniza began to weave the tale of Esteban's murder and his brave escape from the golden city of Cibola. It could have also been a bastardization of the Tewa place of origin that we talked about, the Lake of Copala. But regardless, Deniza hadn't been to this Cibola, and there was no gold. It was no new Tenochtitlan. But wait, there's more. Not only is there one city of Cibola, according to Deniza, there were seven. Never mind the fact that there are only five Zuni Pueblos. Interestingly, in Scott Ortman's Winds from the North, which I used a lot in the last episode, and which describes the movement of the Mesa Verde on Asazi into the Rio Grande Valley. It is a central theme of the last episode. But uh, Ortman brings up the origins of the Cibola legend that I had not yet read. Ortman's discussing the origins of the Mexica peoples, like the Aztec, and uh, he's talking about their mythical homelands that the Spanish wrote down from oral tradition. Like Aztlan, which I mentioned some time ago. But the Spanish became obsessed with these these origin places and finding them. They were seemingly just as curious as modern researchers, but also hungry for those places of possible wealth. Well, one Spanish chronicler in the 1500s wrote about these homelands and the myths associated with them, and Ortman summarizes it thusly. These legends refer to Aslan, Huehuetlalpalan, and Tlalpalan as places in the north from which these peoples came down in to Mexico. One group lingered at a place called Seven Caves on their way down. Tlalpalan came to be identified with Seven Caves, and then merged with the Seven Cities of a Portuguese romance to become the Seven Cities of Cibola that Marcos de Niza and Coronado searched for in 1539 to 1540, end quote. The Spanish really did care about where these people they had conquered, uh, like like the Aztecs and Mexicas. They really did care about where they had come from because they believed that the places of myth were filled with riches beyond their imagination, just like Tenochtitlan uh, or modern-day Mexico City, but just like Tenochtitlan had been an incredible source of wealth. And since the peoples all had stories of them coming from a land to the north and usually by a body of water, The Spanish were forever on the lookout for ancestral homelands, rich with gold and warrior peoples by a body of water northward. Unrelated fact, but eventually, the Spanish would see the Great Salt Lake and the Salt Lake City area, and they would see it as the homeland of the Mexica peoples and even of the Puebloan peoples of the Rio Grande. Uh, This was because they had a series of misinterpretations and misunderstandings that were probably conflated purposefully by the indigenous peoples who were always ready to get rid of the Spanish and send them on apparently northward. I mentioned this Lake of Copala, which is always vaguely to the northwest, that the Tewa people call their homeland in the previous episode. This vaguely to the northwest lake, where they may have emerged from, is quite possibly the Great Salt Lake. This is talked about a good bit in Ortman's Winds from the North. Denise's lies or fabrications, or if you want to be fair, maybe exaggerations, these stories by the man of cloth, that is Denise, mixed with already fantastic satires of distant wealth and treasure, and that was enough. The next thing the region knew, Spain was launching, according to Robert, one of the most ambitious entradas in all of the Americas into the Southwest. This entrada, or what we would call maybe an exploratory party, But it's more than that. It's like an exploratory party with instructions to also conquer the land and its people. Of course, for Spain. The East India Trading Company comes to mind uh, as a similar function, or maybe the original British colonies of the Americas, now that I think about it. Uh, But this entrada was led by Francisco Vasquez de Coronado. He began his journey in that city of Culiacan with 350 Spaniards, 1,300 Mexican Indian allies, quite a few slaves and servants, four friars, including the exaggerating Marcos de Niza, 559 horses, and 1,500 heads of sheep, cattle, and pigs. It was a veritable army, and it was so large that the Spaniards who remained in Mexico City actually feared for their own safety, because so many soldiers and uh, 
what few Indian allies they had, were leaving. But they had their orders and their desires. And those included the directive to loot the land and claim it and the natives for Spain and for God. So these natives, who exactly were the people on the land, these Puebloans? What did Nuevo Mexico, which it was not even called that yet, but what did the area look like? Well, obviously, I hope you listened to my previous episode, which answers, or at least attempts to answer, just that. If you haven't listened, you should. But if you haven't, you can head to the website where I have a few maps I made myself to help you all out. But for a refresher... At the time of Coronado's Entrada in the 1500s, there were at least 110 pueblos, with possibly 80,000 residents. There were pueblos all along the Rio Grande, starting south of current-day Albuquerque and going north to Taos. There were pueblos in the Jemez Mountains to the west of Albuquerque and Santa Fe, and there were pueblos south of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, which are to the east of Santa Fe. Then there's the Acamo Pueblo to the west of the Jemez Mountains, and the Zuni are west of Acamo, near the border of modern-day New Mexico and Arizona. And then all the way out in northeast Arizona are the Hopi Mesas. Among the 80,000 possible peoples were four distinct language families, and some of these language families are separated by mountains or by completely other language families. As Steve Lexen, a favorite author and archaeologist of mine, as Steve Lexen says of the whole Rio Grande Pueblo area and how its distribution of people came to be, he says, quote, It's one of the most intractable problems in all of southwestern prehistory. End quote. Words like intractable, baffling, perplexing, and more similar ones are used to describe the Puebloans' layout upon the land of the Rio Grande Valley by the more than four or five authors that I read. Naturally, I attempted to untangle the web, but only at the surface level in my previous episode. So again, listen if you have not. Otherwise, I suggest you open some books written by infinitely more knowledgeable men and women than I. Another reason why it is not overly imperative to lay out completely the language map of the people, at least uh, as they speak it now, is because researchers aren't even sure what languages the Puebloans spoke at the time of contact. Again, those fault lines that I mentioned in the intro. But also because of how much movement, destruction, and suppression actually happens over the next 80 years. Well, more actually. But all these years that I'm about to discuss, from these 1500s to 1680. Sadly, the Pueblo's population by the revolt of 1680 will number less than 20 thousand. Remember when I said when Coronado enters, it's 80,000. 75%. Certainly, though, the linguistic makeup back then was, if not the same in richness and differences, was possibly even more so. Which that fact alone, as Roberts puts it, quote, if it does nothing else, however, the patchwork of languages underscores just how remarkable an event it was that in 1680 most of the Pueblos united in a common cause and executed Pope's plan on a single day. End quote. We'll get to Pope way later, but Roberts is right. It is incredible that the plan was ever pulled off. It's also amazing the Spanish were ever able to reign over so many Puebloans with so few people at all. But as we'll see, it wasn't as ironclad a ruling over as they'd have liked it to be. And of course, at the time of the Spanish arrival, the Kachina cult was all important to many of the Pueblos, as was discussed deeply and heavily in the last episode. But the Kachinas were about to face the dark reality of being driven underground for almost a century, which, as I hinted at at the end of the last episode, helped to fuel this Pope's Pueblo revolt. But again, we're way ahead of ourselves. On July the 7th, 1540, Francisco Vazquez de Coronado, the ex-governor of Nueva Galicia and the youngest of six boys with no hopes of gaining wealth from his family, 
but all the hopes of gaining it by being a conquistador. Well, in the summer of 1540, Coronado and his army of what I'm assuming was around 2,000, uh, Spaniards and Mexican Indians, at least 2,000, I say assuming because he didn't record the number of slaves or servants, women, and children, but let's assume the number of foreigners entering the land of enchantment is about 2,000. On July 7th, a forward party of Spaniards reached the very first golden city of Cibola, which was that same Pueblo of Hawica, the same city that uh, disappeared Esteban. The fact that Esteban's never heard from again, though, is probably sign enough that the man was toes and nose up to the sky. Then again, as we will learn, the Puebloans are mighty good at keeping secrets. But with this forward party... Their elation at reaching the Golden City had to have turned into furious frustration, which must have only grown as they waited on the rest of the party to catch up to them. And once they did, the massive trail of immigrants found that the Golden City was made of mud. Mud and straw. And maybe if the sun hit it just right? Coronado himself said of the situation of discovering that the place was made primarily of adobe mud, quote, This distressed the men-at-arms not a little, especially when they saw that everything the friar had said to be was the opposite. End quote. That friar, remember, was Marcos de Niza, and he was there, with them. Lucky guy. And by not a little, Coronado means, he doesn't mean, like I would say it, Coronado means it distressed them not a little, but a lot. I mean, can you imagine the scene? Think of all the years of preparation and excitement, and then finally leaving, and the stories around the nightly campfires as they made their way through what had to be quite a frightening and exciting landscape, with dark and distant mountains and forests, deserts filled with spikes and cactuses, canyons, thorns, lions, and panthers, and bears, and snakes, and hostile Indians, oh my. And all the while, keeping your spirits up with laughing and drinking with your buddies or family members or fellow soldiers or strange new indigenous friends, as you all collectively imagine the hordes of gold you're going to collect. They thought they could just peel the gold straight off the walls and roofs. They were going to be richer, uh, they thought, than the conquistadors who had come before them, richer than those who had conquered the Incas, and even the Aztecs, richer than Cortes himself. They followed the paths, probably long etched into the landscape, from millennia of natives, including the Anasazi. But they followed these paths up the Sierra Nevadas, and up the coast of the Gulf of California, and into the American Southwest, in search of these not one, but seven cities of gold. And then, once they were in sight, they could clearly see it was just mud. Like the no doubt countless buildings they'd come across, built by countless other Indians on their journey. And on top of that, there were only five of them anyways. Not to mention, they were hungry, and they were tired, and they'd used up a good bit of supplies on their way up. I can understand their anger and desire to kill the very man who'd seemingly made up this whole story. Friar Marcos de Niza, who, like I said, was among the enormous party. According to Coronado himself, he feared for the friar's life at one point when the conquistadors were itching for a scapegoat to murder. Apparently, Coronado personally saved him, de Niza, from this group of angry conquerors. But... Someone had to get murdered at this betrayal. Which is why this anger eventually translated, despite having explicit orders to not harm the natives, but this anger would eventually cause a pitched battle with said natives. Not immediately, though. At first, Coronado approached a group of bow and arrow carrying Zuni, announced in Spanish that he came in peace, and he laid down his weapons. At this point... The armed and angry Zuni from Hawika made a line of maize in the sand, apparently in the hopes that the Spaniard wearing this silver armor on horseback 
and loaded with lances and guns and swords, who was leading an army in the hopes that uh, he would not cross the corn line. But Coronado did cross the corn line. At that point, the Zuni men fired their arrows, even hitting Coronado himself. He was actually severely injured. But in the end, the Spaniards and their arquebuses killed 12 of the Indians. And then they looted the city for food and treasure as the Puebloans fled north. The Pueblo of Hawica would actually last for quite some time after this brutal sacking and after the people had returned from the hills. Although it would ultimately be destroyed and left abandoned only four years before the Pueblo Revolt in the year 1676. Not because of the Spanish, mind you, but because of Apache raiders, which you'll learn all about. Actually, it isn't quite fair to say not because of the Spanish. The Spanish policies before the revolt absolutely helped spurn violent Indian attacks on the Puebloans. But, yeah, that's some foreshadowing for you. After the sacking of Hawica, the Spaniards would build a massive church above the all-important circular kiva to prove the dominance of the Christian religion over the Indians' own Kachina culture. And because of this particular colonization and conversion feature, which happened all over the southwest, not quite yet, but after this time, David Roberts was told by a Zuni woman named Sethlikia that because of this church on top of the kiva business, the Puebloans turned their subterranean circular kivas into above-ground rectangular ones so that they could fit into the architecture of the Pueblo, thus escaping the eyes of their Spanish and Catholic overlords. It would work, too. Although, if you'll remember from the previous episode, the ancestral Puebloans after the 1300s were already beginning to turn their kivas into rectangles. It's hard to ever tell what's fact and fiction with the Puebloans, and you can't blame them. And remember, if I ever get anything wrong, let me know. As the winter of 1540 approached, Coronado and his enormous expedition decided it needed to hole up for the coming cold weather. So they chose a place they called the province of Tigüesh. Tigüesh? Tigüe? I do not know. Tigüe, maybe. The province of Tigüe, near modern-day Albuquerque. Once in this colorfully named province, they chose a pueblo, a place they called Alconfor, which modern-day researchers cannot quite pinpoint the location of. But once at Alconfor, the expedition expelled the natives and took the entire Pueblo over, all the while demanding the Puebloans feed and clothe them, oh, and help keep them warm, since the Spaniards' resupply train had inexplicably turned around 500 miles to the south. I can only imagine this supply train must have ran into some trouble, like so many future supply trains will, even 150 years into the future. I imagine these people ran into some hostile locals or terrible weather or both and decided to heck with this crazy Coronado. But regardless of why, this left the Spaniards up north in uh, quite a pickle. While Coronado and his men waited out the winter in the Pueblo of Tigües, their demands grew until the Puebloans began refusing them. I mean, partly because they had to. This in turn angered the Spanish enough to cause them to burn down and depopulate many of the Pueblos in the Tigüesh region. The number I read was that 13 Pueblos were destroyed, and many of the inhabitants were roasted at the stake. Things were not getting off to a great start, and the Puebloans were already over it, as well they should have been. Tired of this tyranny from the foreigners, the Puebloans at the time got together, a couple of them did, and hatched what a historian who shares my last name, a Carol Riley, uh, what Carol Riley calls the Pecos Plot. The Pecos Plot involves a Pawnee Indian, well, most likely, who uh, he was most likely a Pawnee Indian, but the Spanish nicknamed him the Turk, because apparently he reminded the Spanish of an Ottoman Turk. But the Pecos plot involves the Turk and his grand plan to lead the Spanish and Coronado out onto the Great Plains in search of the, for real this time, guys, golden city of Cibola. He told them of fish the size of horses, huge canoes with 20 rowers, and lots and lots of gold. <laughs> 
The Turk also told Coronado that the leader of this giant city napped under an enormous tree, which, quote, were hung a great number of little gold bells, end quote. The Spanish really loved their gold and their bells. And the Native Americans from Chile to the U.S. would all come to know that fact quite intimately. If the Turk was indeed a Pawnee, though, he would have known all too well that the Great Plains are not filled with neither gold nor cities made of said gold, nor are there fish the size of horses. But the Spanish absolutely did not know that. So after that rough winter in April of 1541, Coronado and 1,700 Spanish and enslaved Tigüesh Puebloans set out for the gorgeous and beautiful thorny, windy, treeless, bison-covered rolling hills and endless sweeping vistas where you can see the back of your head if you squint into the distance, plains of the Texas Panhandle, Oklahoma, and Kansas. If you haven't been to the area and you're interested in what it's like, not only will I very shortly have an episode over the Llano Estacado, but I actually already have quite a few episodes which give you a good idea. My Buffalo Soldier series, my very first episode over the Buffalo, both those should give you a semblance of an idea of what the place is like. Not to mention my episode uh, over the Cowboys and the Explorers. I personally lived in Oklahoma for 11 years and a few months in Manhattan, Kansas. For a bit after college, uh, so like a long time ago, over 10 years ago, thank you very much, I owned a company with a friend that took me all over the state of Oklahoma. And before that, I worked for an oil company that also sent me all over the Sooner State. So I've seen it all. And let me tell you, I ain't never been to heaven, but I've been to Oklahoma. I'm kidding. In reality, it seems like God took that seventh day of rest a little too soon. Because it uh, appears he forgot to finish building the map that is the American Great Plains. After five months wandering around, where the winds come sweeping down the plains, and a whole bunch of fruitless traversing through a seemingly empty landscape, and a good bit of buffalo eating, Coronado realized he had been duped. So, naturally, he tortured the Turk, who again was a Pawnee Indian from the area. But he tortured the Turk, who probably with a painful smile, eventually admitted he'd made the whole thing up. Coronado had him summarily garroted. Then the whole group headed back to the Pueblos. But on their way back, in a fitting turn of events that pretty much sums up the whole failure that this entrada into North America would become, Coronado fell off his horse, which left him permanently disabled. Back at the Santa Fe Valley Pueblos, they would stay for one more winter before heading back down to New Spain. Obviously, the Puebloans were elated. Although, they didn't lose all the Spanish. Two apparently suicidal friars decided they were going to stay behind to teach these humble natives of the Lord's love. And no, Marcos de Niza was not among them. Which, maybe if he had had any honor, he would have been. These two friars, though clearly wanted to see God, because probably, I'm making, you know, I'm imagining this, but immediately after Coronado and his men were out of sight, the Puebloans murdered both of them. Then, for the next 39 years, the Puebloan world was graciously and blissfully untouched by the Spanish. But, of course, the Spanish eventually did return. The next set of Castilians to enter New Mexico weren't looking for gold, but rather souls. There was a convent in Chihuahua, pretty far south of the Pueblos of the Rio Grande, but not far south enough. Maybe because the local Indians wanted to save their northern brothers, their souls, or maybe because they wanted the church leaders that were lording over them to leave. Either way, Fray Augustine Rodriguez was told about the godless heathen Puebloan cousins to the north, and he had no option but to go and save them himself. In 1581, Rodriguez and a military man, Francisco Sanchez Chamuscado, along with nine soldiers, three friars, and 19 Indians, headed north. I mean, that is such a tiny number compared to the, what was it, almost 
2000 that Coronado came up with? And speaking of Coronado, it is suggested by the researchers that I read that this Rodriguez and Chamuscado group may not have even known about Coronado's visit to New Mexico at all. And they actually thought they were the first to arrive up there, which is hard to believe. But from the expedition's writings, it seems to be true. Everywhere these Spaniards went, though, the Puebloan people would flee at the first inkling of their arrival. They'd run up to the hills, no doubt remembering Coronado. And this is also exactly what the Rara Murray did when they saw Spanish as well, if you'll remember the Anasazi migration episode. This Rodriguez Chamuscado group spent 10 months in the greater New Mexico region where they encountered 60 Pueblos. Although, according to modern historians, none of these 60 listed Pueblos can be correlated to any of the current living Pueblos, or even ruins. The longest lasting impact of this expedition, then, would have to be what they named the area. San Felipe de Nuevo, Mexico. That uh, San Felipe part was an homage to King Philip of Spain. No one wanted to say that mouthful, though. So it was uh, shortened pretty quickly to Nuevo Mexico, which in English is New Mexico. Another interesting occurrence on this expedition was the death of the third friar in Nuevo Mexico. To really prove to the Spanish that the Puebloans do not like the brown-robed cross-bearing guys, a Juan de Santa Maria, against the wishes of his entire party, decided he was going to head to New Spain to tell the good Spanish people down in Mexico all about the crazy things the Puebloans were doing. He didn't make it very far, though. Actually, he'd only made it to the Sandia Mountains, north of Albuquerque, before he needed to take a little snooze. But this friar's luck ended when he woke up dead. I know. Man, how you gonna wake up dead? The local Puebloans had already decided this guy's gotta go. So they crept up above the sleeping Spaniard before they let loose a boulder, which fell on him and crushed him. They then covered his Looney Tunes looking limbs that were sticking out from under the boulder with a bunch of other rocks before no doubt walking away while whistling with their hands in their pockets. Roberts says of this death that, quote, Dropping a big stone on a sleeping man, ethnographers would later learn, was the prescribed Pueblo fashion for dispatching a witch. End quote. That whole uh, accusing the friars and priests and Christians of witchcraft thing, that'll be a, a lasting uh, occurrence. And vice versa, actually. At the end of this expedition, two more friars, including Rodriguez, decided that martyrdom is probably pretty cool. So they stayed behind. A later expedition learned that they were you'll be shocked to know, murdered. And speaking of that later expedition, it was one of four more that was sent. But this one was sent specifically to retrieve those two already dead friars. Mission failed. This was the Espejo expedition, which was led by a wealthy fugitive from the law who'd come up from De to Chihuahua, a man named, obviously, Espejo. To aid in the legality of this mission, the friars, who really wanted to get their brothers back, but the friars bypassed the necessary paperwork with some documents of their own, and then off they went to bring back their uh, left-behind brethren. Also, 14 soldiers and one friar, and Espejo. They all headed up north. His real reason, Espejo, his real reason for going up north, was obviously to escape the law, but also to search for wealth, which he would do all over the land, but only after the small party learned of the two friars' deaths. At that news, they decided to met out some frontier justice. At the Pueblo of Pure, they imprisoned some Puebloan men, locked them in their kiva, pulled up the ladder, and set the entire Pueblo on fire. The ones who weren't burned either fled or were taken to some cottonwoods nearby, where they were, quote, garroted and shot many times until they were dead, end quote. Uh, that quote was from a Spanish chronicler who finished that story with, quote, 
This was a remarkable deed for so few people in the midst of so many enemies. End quote. Well, yeah, having horses, arquebuses, and shiny armor really does come in handy. The next Spanish expedition was an illegal gold hunting foray. The third expedition after Coronado was a lawful one sent to arrest the previous unlawful treasure hunters. And the fourth and final expedition before the big colonization of a man we will talk about soon. Um, But this fourth and final expedition ended, according to Roberts, quote, somewhere out on the Buffalo Plains when one of the two leaders stabbed the other to death. The Indians then wiped out the rest of the party, end quote. So, in Nuevo Mexico, we have Coronado and his massive army and their destruction and fire and theft and death. We have a smaller party after a short break, and this party does a whole lot of nothing except name the place and allow a bunch of friars to get to heaven. The next group burns yet another Pueblo to the ground with people still in it before slicing throats and shooting the dying Puebloans. Then finally, you have some treasure hunters some lawmen, and some poor souls who murder each other before being murdered themselves. It's not hard for me to understand why the Puebloans want nothing to do with the Spaniards, and their soldiers, and their brown-robed witches, and their arquebuses, which is really just a cool word for an old rifle. But the Puebloans' desires don't amount to much if the king of Spain has decided it's time to colonize the place. It also doesn't help when the man who chooses himself for the job of colonizer has been called the last conquistador. It's here in the story where we really set the stage for the coming Pueblo revolt. The next 80 years are going to be very tough for the Puebloans. It's going to be tough for the Spanish conquerors and their descendants as well, but the Puebloans truly suffer. Pretty brutally. And they suffer directly from the many Spanish rulers and governors and friars and priests. They don't only suffer from the Spanish. And their new neighbors, the Navajo, Apache, Utes, and Comanche, also throw their spears and arrows into the mix to make life as difficult for the Puebloans as possible. And even beyond the Athabascans and the Spanish, one man in particular, a man who is from the Iberian Peninsula, but a man who is not Spanish. Rather, he is Basque. A man named Don Juan de Oñate y Salazar, or Oñate for short. Oñate truly shows the Puebloans what life under God in Spain is really all about. First off, who or what is a Basque, you may ask? The Basque are an indigenous European people on the border of Spain and France in the Pyrenees Mountains. They herd sheep, fish on the coast of the Bay of Biscay, make cool cheeses in caves, and have generally tried to be left alone by foreign invaders. Which makes what Oñate is about to do seem somewhat counterintuitive. The Basques are for real indigenous to the area I just mentioned in Europe. They've been there a very long time. It's possible that they've been in that part of Europe beyond 12,000 years. They could be the descendants of the cannibalistic group of people known as the Magdalenians of Western Europe. They made cave art and drank from human skulls. And these people were probably the first to arrive since the Salutrians, way back when it was still very cold and icy. I've mentioned the Salutrians before in the Mammoth Eaters episode if you'll remember. I know that was a long time ago. Some genetic research suggests that the Basque are a mix of these Magdalenians and then later farmers who arrived during the Neolithic period, which let's just say that was a long time ago. When these farmers arrived, even before the Indo-European Celts, but when these Neolithic farmers arrived and mixed with the local skull cup hunter-gatherers, They became a distinct and isolated people for thousands and thousands of years after that. The Basque language is what's known as a language isolate, which means it is related to no other language alive. Not just no language in the area, but no other language as far as linguists can tell. Kind of like the Zuni in the Southwest, 
Some theories about the Basque language still exist, though. A bunch have uh, been rejected, but some still remain plausible. One theory relates Basque to Chechen, or other languages from the Caucasus Mountain regions. Another theory has Basque related to a large group of languages called the Dine Caucasian superfamily of languages. This curious hypothesis suggests that both Athabascan and Basque, as well as a few others, but Athabascan, spoken by the Navajo or Dine, spoken by the Navajo in the New World and the Four Corners area, and by the indigenous groups on both sides of the Pacific and the Arctic of Siberia and North America. That language, Athabascan, and Basque, all the way in Spain and France, are descended from the same parent language, whose speakers spread out at the base of the glaciers throughout the Eurasian continent, with one group going east, that would be the Athabascans, and one group going west as far as they could, that would be the Basques. Which, yeah, sure, I love it, I'm down. I got no skin in the game, so I'm just relating to you guys what I've learned. Apart from those cool facts about the Basque, my mom's DNA ancestry results suggest she is part Basque. I mean, we know her family came from France, but Basque territory? Her family may have originally been from France, but I guess they're technically from Louisiana, which, you know, occasions, right? She has a wild and exciting ancestry and family history. Uh, My mother never met her biological father, so who knows what his story is, but my mom's got Native American, Black, Basque, French, and, obviously, English ancestors. My father's ancestry is like 99% the whitest person alive, and I do take after my dad quite a bit. But like I've been saying for months, migration, migration, migration. Last Quick side note, one of my best friends in the whole world is is Basque. We call him El Basco. I met him in Milwaukee. Uh, he's in Spain right now. But on New Year's Day 2021, my wife and I went to uh, a restaurant in Paris with him, and we had one of the best meals of our lives. Frog legs, escargot, and these airy pastries in a wine sauce, boar pate, andouille sausage, cheesy potatoes, lamb in a cream sauce. It was phenomenal. Anyways, where? Where are we? Where were we? Oh yeah, the Onyate in New Spain. Because his father had moved the family there from Europe in 1524. Onyate himself was born in Zacatecas, which was a hard and a tough land, surrounded by those Chichimecas that I talked about a couple episodes ago. The story goes that by ten years old, Onyate was taking up arms against the angry Native Americans he called barbarians. Ten years old is a very young age to be fighting and or possibly even killing or even dying in battle. But witnessing such brutality at that age must have had an effect on the young Basque who was living in New Spain. He would later say he heard stories and saw evidence of the Chichimecas roasting and eating captive Spaniards and Basques. It was a hard life and conquered territory surrounded by people who did not want you there. But he would survive and prosper, actually. And it would set him up for his future career as being surrounded in a conquered territory by people who do not like you. At 40 years old, so kind of late in life, really, after he found a silver mine in Boomtown called San Luis Potosi, and then becoming its mayor, Onyate decided it was his duty to head on up north to New Mexico and colonize it for Spain. And then, well, thankfully for him, six years later, the government and DF granted him his permission and gave him his chance to make history. Interesting quick side note about Onyate. As if his life wasn't and won't be interesting enough, as you'll soon hear, He married into Aztec royalty. His wife, Isabel de Tolosa Cortés de Moctezuma, was the great-granddaughter of Emperor Moctezuma Xocoyotzin, or Moctezuma II. Obviously, we're just going to call him Moctezuma II. He was the king of the Ecatepec Altipetl. If you remember what an Altipetl is, it's like a, a rotating kingship, princely rulers, You'll have to go back and listen to the Chaco episode. But 
He was the king of the Ecatepec Altepetl and the emperor in charge of the Aztecs when the Europeans, the Spanish, showed up. He actually died during the fighting with the Spanish. Historians aren't quite sure how he died. Onete's wife, as her name suggests, I'll say it again, hold on, Isabel de Toloso Cortez de Moctezuma, as her name suggests, Isabella is also the granddaughter of Hernan Cortez, the Hernan Cortez, the guy who overthrew the Aztec Empire. Onate definitely married up. But in reality, his own ancestry is also full of incredibly wealthy and important and powerful families during those Middle Ages, whatever that term may mean. Still, knowing who his wife's recent ancestors were may have made him a little hungry for power and greatness, and left him with a desire to also make a name for himself to equal that of her own families. But I'm just speculating. Here's a quote in Robert's Pueblo Revolt about the character of the man who would go on to conquer the Puebloans and set a precedent of brutality for the far-flung colony to follow for almost a century. In his biography, The Last Conquistador, Mark Simmons makes what is probably the shrewdest assessment of Oñate's character to date. The constant vigilance and fierce combat against the Chichimecans that subscribed his youth in Zacatecas may, Simmons suggests, and now he's quoting Simmons, have contributed to an air of melancholy that seemed to mark his adult years. Certainly, there exists nothing in the written record to suggest that humor softened his speech or lightened his mood. End all quotes. So, Onyate was a tough and a sad hombre. And after twelve years of setbacks, violence, tough trials, and tribulations, all in New Mexico, it turned him a hard and a cruel. Another quote from Roberts. Onyate's treatment of the Puebloans sowed the field from which would spring the revolt of 1680. And despite the passage of more than four centuries since Onyate's entrada, among the Pueblos, today, a bitter sense of having been wronged serves as the conquistador's enduring legacy in New Mexico. End quote. So, let's dive into this entrada, or conquering expedition, that would shape the region forever. Don Philip to Don Juan de Onyate, resident of the city of Zacatecas. In consideration and appreciation of your personal quality and merits, and of these services that you rendered for twenty years in the war against the Chichimecan Indians of the kingdoms of Nueva Galicia and Nueva Vizcaya, I appoint you as my governor, Captain General, Caudillo, discoverer and pacifier of the provinces of New Mexico and those adjacent and neighboring, in order that, in my royal name, you may enter them with these settlers and armed forces, baggage, equipment, munitions, and other necessary things that you may provide for this purpose. You will endeavor to attract the natives with peace, friendship, and good treatment, which I particularly charge you, and to induce them to hear and accept the Holy Gospel. You will explain our Holy Catholic faith to them through interpreters, if they can be obtained so that we may have communication with them in the various languages and seek their conversion. Let it be done at the opportunity which the friars find most suitable. You will see to it that the latter are respected and revered, as ministers of the gospel should be, so that, with this example, the Indians may attend and honor them and accept their persuasions and teachings. Experience has demonstrated this to be very important, and also that all the people in your company act gently and kindly, without committing excesses or setting bad examples, or irritating those who seek to attract, lest they adopt an unfriendly attitude toward the faith. You are to direct everything to this principal aim. I think Onyate only read the first paragraph of this letter from the King of Spain, this letter that gave him permission and the go-ahead to enter his rightful name into the history books. I think he forgot to read the peacefully conquer and convert the peoples in the area part. For if you read that letter again, or rather listen to me reciting it again 
you'll notice the words kindly and gently, and peace and friendship, and quote, good treatment, which I particularly charge you, end quote. And all of those words are in connection with how Onyate and his conquistadors should treat the natives. I think he only read that first paragraph, because as you'll hear, Onyate's campaign against the Puebloans, especially at Akama, will not end well. But at the same time, how exactly does one conquer peacefully? And speaking of the word conquer, you'll notice that word was not once mentioned in the letter um, of the king to Onyate. And that's because the use of the word when it came to colonizing the lands of the Americas had been outlawed by the Spanish crown uh, in 1573. At that time, King Philip II, the same one, created something called the Laws of Discovery, which forbade, quote-unquote, conquests of the bloody variety, and even outlawed the use of the word in conjunction with colonization. Gone were the days of conquistadors, subjugation of Indians, the torturing, the bloodbaths, and now, to replace it was a more Christian means of taking over a people. Or at least, in theory. Truthfully, the crown in Spain and the viceroy in Defe, or Mexico City, implored Oñate to withhold all violence, as hard and as long as he could, and to rely on their Catholic faith and the friars and on God in peace. They said to him it was imperative that he not resort to pillaging of food stores or clothing, like the previous expeditions had done, and to not take women or to burn Pueblos, as the others had done as well. They really stressed that the outnumbered colonizers could not anger the Puebloans so much so that they murdered the entire lot of them before a colony could even be started, or, more importantly, the souls be saved. And the king really did want a colony set up in the territory. Not only for the riches, which... Surely, must have been hiding under the ground there, right? Spoiler alert, the Spanish don't find them. So not only for material wealth, but also for the treasure of souls converted unto God. When you read the documents from the crown and the Spanish leaders, they're really not liking the news of the previous expeditions, and they seemingly genuinely worried about how the natives were being treated. The viceroy even told Onyate to find and arrest the renegade men, or man, who they thought was still out there. Uh, That would be the ones who'd been killed by his own men before the rest of them had been killed on the Great Plains. The viceroy, a personal friend of Onyate's, believed arresting the possible tyrant would send a good message to the Puebloans. But the Puebloans' memory hadn't faded of all the previous wrongs the Spanish had so far wrought on their lands. So, now in our story, it's 1598, and at the head of the largest expedition into the American Southwest since Coronado, sat Oñate. Behind him were 560 future colonists with 129 soldiers, a whole lot of Indian quote-unquote servants, numerous women and children, including his eight-year-old son Cristobal, whom he made a lieutenant, and whom will later go on to become an interim governor of New Mexico. But all of those people were with him, as well as 7,000 cattle, sheep, goats, oxen, donkeys, mules, and horses. He also brought 13,500 nails, three cannons, 18 barrels of gunpowder, plenty of precious arquebuses, lances, saddles, shields, and all manner of weapons. Also, to trade with the locals, he brought 80,000 glass beads, plenty of rosaries, and quite a few tin crosses. Of this, colonizing caravan must have been a sight to see as it strung itself out along the Sonoran Desert. It, no doubt, had to alert every Native American within a hundred miles or more of its presence. These people, these Spanish, clearly meant business. Coronado hadn't been there to stay, just to pillage. These people, on the other hand, 
They'd come to stay. And they may have been the first ones to do so in a thousand years. At least since the southern Anasazi ancestors came up much the same route. And they did that to spread their culture and knowledge and religion in what was probably a whole lot of the same way. It isn't hard for me to see the parallels between the ancient Anasazi from the south coming up and ruling the land and the Spanish. I mean, ultimately, from across the sea, the Spanish are, but in this important moment, they too are just coming up from the south to rule over the land with their god and their architecture and their form of government. In the end, history has informed us that uh, neither were meant to stay and rule. But both would leave their indelible marks. It took the two-mile-long caravan five months to reach their new homes. And by that time, Onyate had been, according to Roberts, stretched to his breaking point. But he didn't break yet. At first, as they arrived to each Pueblo, the same thing happened that had been happening since Coronado. The Puebloans knew of Onyate's approach, for sure. They had to have for weeks before they'd even arrived. And by that time, all of the residents had fled for the hills. But they would slowly trickle back down as peace, beads, and other goods were offered. At this point, Onyate would claim the Pueblo for Spain and move on up the river to the next Pueblo. I mean, uh, it's obviously understandable why they fled. The Puebloans had no doubt heard about the other Indians down south that were constantly being enslaved by men with guns on horses who would kidnap them and sell them. I mean, the Puebloans themselves had been enslaved, some of them at least, but they had been enslaved when Coronado was there. Remember the over 1,000 Tiwesh Puebloans who accompanied him to the Great Plains? Certainly, these stories stayed in the Puebloans' collective memory. Not to mention the other Puebloans killed during the other forays. We actually know they remembered that the Spanish came because later Puebloans would tell Oñate and his men after um, Oñate asked him why they had ashen crosses on their foreheads. They would reply that earlier white men with beards had arrived and told them that if other white men with beards arrive in the future to be sure and have the cross on their head so they won't treat them badly. But thankfully for the Puebloans, they weren't yet treated badly. As the, the newcomers, Oñate, they attempted to peacefully make their way to the swampy area around Santa Fe to build the capital. Temporary capital, but to, to build the capital of the new Spanish colony. I was actually kind of surprised to learn that Santa Fe sits on a swamp, because you wouldn't know it if you traveled there now. Uh, totally unrelated, but I was just there this last New Year's Eve um, for pleasure and for research while traveling back to Southern California from Wisconsin with my wife and my dog, and I just love that city. It is so gorgeous, and the history is great, and the architecture is great, and the mountains around it are great. If you haven't been, you've got to go. In a rather dramatic scene that almost seems unbelievable, once Oñate and his caravan arrived to the Pueblo of Santo Domingo, or Quewa, as the Puebloans called it, uh, Quewa sits not far from Santa Fe in a southwestern direction, but once Oñate got there, he managed to gather the leaders of some 33 different Pueblos together, and he gathered them all inside a large kiva, uh, and inside this cramped space he spoke to them. He used four different interpreters while speaking to them, and he spoke to them about why he was there and what his mission was, and that he had come in peace, compas. He then gave them a Sunday school lesson on there being only one God, on heaven and hell, and briefly on the Pope. He then told them in no uncertain terms that they were now part of Spain and vassals of the Spanish crown. Just... Think about that scene for a minute. These silver-plated, arquebus-carrying, horse-riding, Iberian Peninsula European people with their crosses and their brown-robed holy men, they gather your family, friends, enemies, and I guess for enemies, they gather everyone together and they speak in a language you don't understand. I mean, some of these Puebloan people couldn't even understand each other, 
But these Spaniards and Basques declared to the people through interpreters from northern Mexico, which probably only a few of the Puebloans even understood, but they told them, or I guess they tell you if you're imagining it, that you are now subject to a king who resides across the ocean, who you will never meet, and who will never come over here, and through his authority, I, Onyate, am now your ruler. Oh, and also, you'll have to kneel. And... Surprisingly, they did kneel. Twice. The second time, the kneeling only ended after they also kissed the friar's hand. Then Onate told them they all have to get baptized because otherwise they're going straight to hell, and it's a very bad thing. Even if you've never heard of it, it's terrible. According to Onate, all the Puebloan leaders of these 33 some odd Pueblos agreed. They agreed that this was cool and good, and they were totally happy and accepted this with, in his own words, with, quote, great rejoicing, end quote. Onyate would consistently prove to be completely delusional when it came to how the Puebloans felt about he and the other Iberians. And truthfully, he would not be the only one over the next 80 years to be wrong about the elation with which the Puebloans felt towards their conquerors. After the people pledged their loyalty to Spain and God, Oñate would set up his home base at the Pueblo of Oqueahuingue, practically on top of the old site, and he'd name it San Juan de los Caballeros. Or, I guess, he wouldn't name it, but his poet captain would call it that, which in Spanish means Saint John of the Warrior Knights. This warrior poet I just mentioned will be brought up again later. But he named it that because, quote, In memory of those noble sons who first raised in these barbarous regions the bloody tree upon which Christ perished for the redemption of mankind. End quote. The Spanish really did think highly of themselves, and they really loved that Catholic religion. Well, most of them. But you can't really blame them for thinking so highly of themselves, really. Their invasion into... North America, well, I guess into the entirety of the Americas, this whole hemisphere, their invasion would be equal to like an alien force landing on Earth and decimating us with ease today. Although, as the U.S. military knows quite well, and Oñate and later Spaniards will soon know, insurgencies are a difficult thing to conquer completely if you ever do it. At the new capital, um, which would only be the capital until 1610, when it would move to Santa Fe. But at this new capital, San Juan de los Caballeros, Oñate had the first church built in the area. And as far as he could tell, the people were more than happy to be sharing their homes with the new conquerors. I mean, their new friends. According to local legend, though, the arrival of the Spanish did have some good things for the Pueblo. Um, It... Their arrival joined two rival clans who'd been fighting for some time. They'd been fighting because one family was from the north and the other family was from the south, which sounds like a hangover from the Anasazi Civil War, if you ask me. It just so happened the later leader of the Pueblo Revolt himself, that man I mentioned, Pope, he was born at San Juan de los Caballeros. And no surprise, Pope you will learn about in the next episode, but Pope belonged to the Tewa Northern Faction. Once he'd established the new capital, and after he'd ordered the building of churches and homes, Onyate set out on a five-month-long reconnaissance mission of his brand new territory. He needed to introduce himself to all the other Puebloans, and, of course, he needed to look for all traces, or any trace, of any precious metal. Please, Dios, let there be gold. He'd go north to Taos, east to Pecos, south down into the Galisteo Basin, south of Santa Fe, which is that area north of the Sandia Mountains, and he'd travel west to the Jemez Mountains and the Jemez Pueblo, that future hotbed of anti-Spanish sentiment. In September, he fared much better on the Great Plains than had the last few Spaniards to wander them. Uh, While he was out there, he hunted bison in the far east for his hungry colonists and, of course, was looking for gold. 
Then in October, he decided to also explore to the far southwest. Part of this expedition was to get to the Pacific Ocean, which Roberts says was only feasible him getting to the Pacific Ocean on account of bad maps and lots of rumors. Because in reality, the Gulf of California was about 600 miles to the southwest of Santa Fe. But the Pacific Ocean was much further than that. This excursion into western New Mexico would prove, though, uh, to be a turning point for the colonial expedition. A turning away from the peace and friendly attitudes the Castile Crown commanded, and towards that all-too-familiar story of historical colonial violence. This unfortunate but seemingly inevitable violence would begin at a place called Acoma, or the Sky City Pueblo. Acoma lays claim, along with two Hopi villages uh, that we will also talk about, and those Hopi villages are Walpai and Oraibi, but the three of them, Acoma included, lay claim to being the oldest continuously inhabited towns in the United States. When asked what is the oldest city in the United States, a lot of people would say that would be St. Augustine. But that was established in the 1560s, I think, maybe 1565 or so. Akama, Walpai, and Oraibi have been around for a lot longer than that. They're just not European cities. All three of them are pretty formidable, uh, sitting as they do on top of mesas. But Akama takes the defensive cake. Not sums up uh, Sky City well when he writes that it sits atop a, quote, a rugged and isolated sandstone mesa, 360 feet above the surrounding desert floor. The mesa is massive, with two segments, a southern uninhabited half joined to its northern counterpart by a narrow and treacherous bridge of natural outcropping, covering an area of 70 acres. Its walls are forbidding. The smooth sandstone bluffs not only sheer, but in many places overhanging. End quote. Up at the top of the fortress, the Sky City contains about 500 adobe rooms, many of them two or three stories tall. The streets are narrow and winding, and can become maze-like. Their description reminds me of the old section in Monton on the Mediterranean coast of France or really any old section of a European city or town. Back in the day, or who knows really, it could still be this way today, but when Oñate visited Akuma, there were even tunnels beneath the city that connected the kivas. The drinking water for Akuma is only obtained by collecting rain or snow up on top, or by bringing it up from the mesa's base. And to climb those sheer or overhanging mesa walls? There weren't any guardrails or footpaths, but only finger and toe holds that were hand carved by ancestral Puebloans. Uh, who knows how long ago, honestly? Anthropologists say Akuma was built in the 1200s, but the Akuma Puebloans of today say it's much older than that. And there's really no reason to doubt him. I'm sure if you were to dig below the current Pueblo, an archaeologist would find even older patterns of settlement, just like at so many other places in the American Southwest. And you will notice the 1200s is a lot older than 1565, which is what St. Augustine is claiming it was found. Today, there's a road that was paved in the 40s in order to facilitate the filming of a John Wayne Western. But back in the day, it was, as one Spaniard put it, quote, the best situated Indian stronghold in all Christendom, end quote. So it was here, at the base of the Acoma Pueblo Sky City Mesa, that Oñate decided to camp on his way to the sea that he would not reach in October of 1598. Instead of me cobbling together a patchwork story from the various sources I read, I would like to just read you the words of Roberts himself on what transpired or possibly transpired. Anyways, here's Roberts from Pueblo Revolt about Oñate's visit to Sky City. <laughs> 
The record of what happened next remains highly ambiguous, but a plausible scenario can be cobbled out of the Spanish documents. The spies who had visited San Gabriel had reported back to Acoma. A chieftain known as Zutikapan resolved to make war upon the invaders. But other leaders took a contrary view. Even as Onyate, with only thirty soldiers, slept at the foot of the butte, the Akamans were in the midst of a strenuous debate about how to deal with the interlopers. The peace party, it would seem, prevailed. Akamans swarmed down from their stronghold to offer gifts to the Spaniards. Onyate was convinced that these credulous natives thought that the neighing horses were speaking to each other, a fancy he encouraged in order to inculcate further fear and respect. End quote. At this point, after the gifts and introductions, the Akamo Puebloans invited Onyate, who brought some soldiers with him, but the Akamans invited him up to the Pueblo along that difficult hand and toe hold route. And apparently, I read that once up on the Mesa walls, the Spanish conquistadors who had followed him, in a predetermined signal that they had made it up safe, these conquistadors fired their arquebuses into the air for the ones remaining down below. That show of strength may have been mistake number one. Well, I guess mistake number two. Mistake number one was showing up to Akamo at all. But after this accidental show of force, one of the aforementioned Zutikapan's buddies led Onyate away from his soldiers and towards a kiva, filled with angry armed Puebloans. Apparently there are twelve of them. Although that could be some sort of allegory to the apostles later written by the Spanish, it isn't clear. This whole story isn't clear, really. But apparently within the dark, smoky kiva, surrounding the base of the ladder were twelve Puebloan warriors ready to kill that invading conquistador leader. For whatever reason, though, and honestly, again, this entire scenario cannot be corroborated with any sort of accuracy, but according to legend, at the last moment, which I can almost see cinematically, with Onyate realizing it's a trap. As he's about to climb down the ladder, he grabs the top of the wooden support posts of the lash ladder, about to step onto the rungs, but stopping abruptly after he notices some slight movement, or noise, or some sideways sneer of a smile. He sees that smile out of the corner of his eye by this Zutikapan lieutenant. Maybe he could smell a trap from his years fighting the Chichimecas as Roberts suggested. Regardless of why or if this happened at all, Onyate survived his tour of Sky City, and then he climbed down to his base camp, followed by the Pueblo's leaders, who then proceeded to take the oath of submission and subjugation, like all the other Puebloans had. And I can almost hear it. Thanks for not murdering me, and congratulations, you're now part of Spain, and you're all Spanish subjects, and very shortly we will ask for taxes in the form of food and goods, and you will not be able to give it. Oh yeah, and we will absolutely build a church right over top of your kiva, which will ring its bells every hour, and morning, and for mass, and for anything that we see fit. You'll love the bells, and the friars that go along with them. Have a nice day. Adios. If the plot to kill him in that kiva actually existed and Onyate narrowly escaped death, then the frustration the Puebloans felt at missing the opportunity and then being humiliated, and that missed opportunity definitely boils over shortly. From Akuma, Onyate and his men head towards El Moro, which is a place I have been to and love. El Moro is a big old rock mesa butte that jets out into a valley that sits just ever so northwest of Akuma, on the other side of the volcanic blackness that is El Malpais National Monument. It is El Moro, it is a big sandstone wall with a spring of water that's always flowing, which is obviously helpful to any traveler, ancient or recent, through the area. The coolest thing about El Moro, though, are the awesome Anasazi ancestral Puebloan ruins on the top. And, more importantly for our story, the inscriptions that are carved into the side of the giant white 
Sandstone Butte. There are English ones from more recent explorers and ranchers, and even United States Army units. There are Anasazi petroglyphs. There are ancestral Puebloan Kachinas. And there are Spanish inscriptions, with one of them being Onyate's very own. And I have seen it. I have even taken a picture of it. I recognized uh, way back when I saw it that it was old and Spanish and seemingly important, although I did not yet know its significance, at least until reading this episode. So I remembered that I took that picture and I went back and looked at them from, oh, it was back in 2018. And lo and behold, I have a picture of Onyate's inscription. It has been uh, emboldened by the past NPS Rangers National Park Service Rangers. They darken it with like pencil lead. They used to. I don't think they do it anymore. Uh, on that ancient sandstone wall, though, Onyate carved, which again I think it's pretty cool that I saw it. But he said in the third person, and uh, then it is translated to English. It said this. There passed this way the Arlentado Don Juan de Onyate from the discovering of the South Sea on the 16th of April, 1605. The first thing you may notice is the word Arlentado, which I have said before, uh, maybe. But that is a really nice Spanish way of saying conquer. The second thing you may have picked up on is that date of April 1605, which is well, after our current story, that is taking place in December of 1598. So, let's get back to the plot. At El Morro, Oñate was waiting for his nephew and Maestro de Campo of the expedition. Uh, and Maestro de Campo is basically his second in command. But Oñate was waiting for his nephew, Juan de Zaldivar, who had been exploring the Great Plains. Zalivar, though, had fallen short of the necessary supplies in the cold weather and decided he'd liberate some from the Puebloans at Acoma. Once at the base of the Pueblo, he had eight soldiers follow the Acoma guides up to the mesa top to retrieve some food and water and other various supplies. The Eight soldiers were led by a Captain Geronimo, I guess, Geronimo Marquez, who, in hindsight, was not the right guy for the job. After requesting the supplies at the Pueblo, Marquez was less than thrilled at what he was given. So he did the only logical thing, and he had his men kidnap the leaders in order to pressure the Puebloans into bringing them down, like the four real goods. Oh, man. As you can imagine, at the base of the Mesa, Zaldivar freaked out and immediately released the hostages. But the damage was done. The following morning, the Puebloans would indeed bring down some supplies, but it was only a meager few tortillas and three or four bushels of maize, which truly was not enough. Zaldivar and his men did actually need some food. So this time, he attempted to trade with the Puebloans. He offered them hatchets and various other metal trinkets for more food. The Puebloans seemed to accept them, and then they claimed they needed around two days to grind the corn to make them more tortillas and food. This obviously relieved Zalivar, who thanked them and then took his men six miles away to a watering hole to camp for the two days. Two probably restless and hungry days. As brutal as the Spanish can be, it is pretty remarkable how brave and sure of themselves they were. I mean, they truly were surrounded and outnumbered by a lot of people who did not want them there. With every mesa or butte top, every mountain peak, behind every boulder or black volcanic rock outcrop, it had to have felt like they were being watched. Plans of their murder being hatched. And 
They probably were. When fate was ready and the time was up, Zaldivar and seventeen of his men traveled a short distance back to Akuma to collect the goods they were promised. Unfortunately for them, the Puebloans had decided not to give in to the Spanish demands after all. The demands which they desired were just too high. I mean, you'll learn later how difficult it was for the Puebloans, but on December 4th, Zaldivar and 14 of his men, with three staying behind to look after the horses, but the 15 of them and some Indian servants, headed up the treacherous and dangerous toe and finger hold path to the top of the mesa. There, he told his men to stay close, stay in sight, and stay cool, honey bunny. But the Puebloans had other plans. After greeting the Spanish, they began to wind the invaders through the narrow maze-like streets. Every home they passed pulled up their ladders and refused to give up their maize flower. Frustrated and hungry, Zaldivar made his final mistake and split his men up and then marched them in different directions across the sprawling Pueblo to ask if anyone had any food or anything they could spare for the soldiers. Then, after the Spanish were thoroughly separated, the Indians let out a signal cry and the entire Pueblo erupted in violence as the Akamans set upon the split-up Spanish groups, all at the same time. They stood no chance. A letter written shortly after the incident by the treasurer of New Mexico to an official in New Spain suggests of the incident that maybe it wasn't premeditated, but instead a Spanish soldier... Uh, a soldier named Vivero took two turkeys from the Puebloans, which brought on an argument, and maybe he killed a Puebloan before he got himself killed, at which point the murderers let out a fearful war cry alarm, which everyone had been trained to respond to. Regardless, when the dust had settled, Zaldivar, two of his captains, eight soldiers, and two Pueblo servants lay dead. The remaining Spanish only survived by throwing themselves off the mesa walls. Obviously, that didn't work for them all. But a few of them did indeed, rather miraculously. But six of them did survive, because, and only because, they landed on sand dunes. One of these survivors recounted later that as he laid on the sand, after surviving the fall and looking up, he saw, quote, The Indians jumping from rock to rock, carrying swords and hats and mocking us, while others hurled the bodies of the dead down the cliff. End quote. This was all obviously terrible news for Onyate who would head back to his capital as soon as he'd heard about the death of his nephew and the soldiers. He knew, though, regrettable retribution must follow. But the decision for retribution, while unwanted, wasn't unwarranted. If the Puebloans got away with this without any punishment at all, what kind of message did that send to the many other Pueblos the many other Pueblos that would no doubt follow suit. After this, at Pecos, as soon as they heard the news, the Puebloans there burned down the church, which was in the process of being built. Then they used the timbers from the church and adobe to construct a brand new kiva. Because of that, it would take 20 years for the Spanish to reoccupy that Pueblo. What if that had happened at every single Pueblo in all the land? This whole venture would have been over before it even started. To the Pueblos, that would have been great, but to the Spanish, that would have been unacceptable. Uh, You've got to remember the Spanish were vastly outnumbered in a land they knew very little about, surrounded by a people they didn't understand. 
or its seemingly even care to. The only way for this colony to work was if a show of force to put down the rebels was swift and vicious. Letter from the king be damned that something had to be done. It was collectively decided that they had to truly punish the Ackermans. Many called for the entire place to be leveled to the ground, including the idiot, uh, we'll call him an idiot, Marquez, the guy who'd kidnapped the village leaders that probably started this whole mess. Although, I'm sure a testing of the Spanish waters was sure to eventually happen. Somewhere. Sometime soon. Other Spanish leaders around the area were hearing the natives ask what the Spaniards are going to do about this uprising. Surely, they were asking with the understanding that if no retaliation occurs, then, uh, hey, it may happen again. Certainly the Spanish would have never known peace. And the Pueblo Revolt of 1680 would have been, instead, the Pueblo Defense of 1600. Then there's the problem of spreading the gospel. If the Spanish appeared weak, so would their God. And that would truly be unacceptable. But they couldn't appear to be too strong and immoral, or no one would respect their God either way. So a careful and a dangerous balance had to be found. John Kessel, uh, one of the other um, resources I used, but John Kessel in his 1978 work, Kiva, Cross and Crown, wrote about the careful balance the colonizers had to make with this tricky Akuma situation. Quote, The governor next called upon Father Commissary Alonso Martinez for a definition of just war. The friar, dutifully citing scripture, church fathers, philosophers, and legalists, concluded, now quoting Father Martinez, Finally, if the cause of war is universal peace or peace in his kingdom, he, the Christian prince, may justly wage war and destroy any obstacle in the way of peace until it is effectively achieved. End quote. The five Franciscan priests on hand, including Father San Miguel, affirmed their superiors very Christian and learned opinion. End all quotes. The people in the Pueblo must be punished. But it, it must be done in a compassionate way so that the missionary Catholic friars could successfully do their duty of bringing the Puebloan souls unto God. That was their thinking. That was their ultimate goal. So with that Tenuous balance decided. Oñate appointed the late Juan de Zaldivar's younger brother, Vicente, as leader of the punitive expedition against the Akamans. Vicente de Zaldivar had actually just been out in the Far East in the Buffalo Kingdom. And he had been there with his older brother Juan before he'd been called to help Oñate find the ocean which obviously led up to this whole situation. But Vicente had been in the Buffalo Kingdom attempting to see if the bison could be tamed. He would find that indeed they could not be. On the open land, he and his soldiers constructed a corral in an effort to trap a couple thousand bison. But instead... If you've listened to my bison episode, you would know that instead of corralling them, he ended up getting three of his horses killed and 40 more of them injured. It's no wonder Oñate keeps asking New Spain for more settlers and horses. I guess I haven't mentioned this, but I read multiple times that Oñate continues to send word back to New Spain and Mexico and say, Hey, I need more soldiers. I need more men. I need more horses. Well, now I read that 43 are out of commission. Of course he needs more horses. In a final vain attempt to do anything at all, Vicente captures a whole bunch of calves, bison calves, but all of them end up dying in captivity. Eventually, he and his men give up and they just kill hundreds of the bison. Bison. 
but at least they bring back what they could of the animals, like bones and furs and, most importantly, meat, but also some fats. He did claim, though, Vicente, correctly, that the bison meat was superior to beef. But now, Vicente Zaldivar, brother of the slain Juan, and nephew and second cousin to Oñate, the governor, captain general, and adelantado of the kingdoms and provinces of New Mexico, and those adjacent and bordering, their pacifier and colonizer for the king, our lord, etc., Vicente was to lead seventy soldiers to, quote-unquote, tame the Akamans. Seventy soldiers, by the way, that was more than half of Oñate's entire army in all of New Mexico. That was quite a gamble sending that many. Because if they failed and they were killed, then very few soldiers were protecting the rest of the settlers. And again, this story would be over if that had happened. While on the path of righteous retribution, though, Vicente and those 70 soldiers were to adhere to the explicit orders of Oñate, of which not in Pueblo Revolt sums up, in his Pueblo Revolt sums up. Zaldivar the Younger was to, quote, offer the natives of Akama the opportunity to surrender peacefully, but he was to proceed brutally with the conquest should that offer be rejected, end quote. Oñate then said to Zaldivar the most important part of his plan, and that was, and now I'm quoting Oñate himself, If you should want to show lenience after they have been arrested, you should seek all possible means to make the Indians believe that you are doing so at the request of the friars with your forces. In this manner, they will recognize the friars as their benefactors and protectors and come to love and esteem them and to fear us. End quote. Remember, to Onyate, the holiness of the church and the respect of God were absolutely vital to his success of conquering New Mexico for Spain. And this careful balance of punishment and compassion would have to be executed perfectly. On January 21st, 1599, Zaldivar and his soldiers arrived at the Sky City Pueblo of Acoma. Once there, no surprise, they did not find a penitent and peaceful band of Puebloans waiting to receive them. Instead, the Acomans had dug holes in the ground around the mesa with which to break the Spanish horse's legs. The Acomans, being up in the air as they were, according to some Spanish sources, uh, including that warrior poet I mentioned earlier, who was apparently a bad poet, but that warrior poet who named the first capital city San Juan de los Caballeros. But according to some Spanish soldiers, including that poet, the Puebloans were quite afraid of the horses, which I did mention earlier. And they even believed their neighing was a language that the Spanish could understand. They understandably, did not want those beasts anywhere near the mesa. So, the Akamans set booby traps. But they were also wearing the armor of the dead Spaniards. And all the while, they were aiming their arquebuses and raising the steel swords of the Spaniards into the air, the swords that they had stolen. War clubs, bows and arrows, killing stones, and all manner of weapons were brandished from the top of the mesa, as Zaldivar inquired why on earth they'd attacked and killed his brother and fellow soldiers. The answer it came back loudly and angrily, and according to the Spanish own official report, the Indians, quote, all shouted loudly, raised their swords on high, and boasted that they had killed ten Spaniards and two Mexicans, and that we were all a pack of scoundrels and whoremongers. End quote. Roberts does make a very good point after he gave that quote, which I just um, said, when he wrote, 
One wonders what the Kirasan word for whoremonger might be. End quote. I imagine, though, that the Catholic Spanish may have blushed at the actual translation that they were given by their Indian interpreter. I'm sure the Puebloans said a word more akin to not whoremonger, but maybe, oh, something John McClane might quip to a terrorist before sending him back to God. Something about Yipikaye. Eventually, Zalrivar and the Spanish were treated to a safe distance away from the mesa top, and they did that for the evening. All the while, that whole night, the Akamas spent the entire time a hooting and a hollering and dancing and taunting and apparently, quote unquote, hissing. Although, I'm not sure how they could hear the hissing from the bottom of the mesa. I do think, though, that the Spanish can be a little dramatic sometimes. Drama or not, that had to have been a very restless night. And the prospect of scaling that mesa, if they had to, must have been nightmare-inducing. I really don't think there's any way that this upcoming battle does not happen. I think the desire to punish the Akamans for their... Well, I guess what the Spanish would have seen as treachery, uh, but what the Puebloans no doubt saw as their own survival. But the desire of the Spanish for justice, the necessity for justice for their own survival, it was just too high for this to not happen. As I mentioned earlier, The Sky City Pueblo may have been the most formidable Pueblo in all of New Mexico. If anyone stood a chance at all at repelling the Spanish, at least repelling them with strength and force, it's these Puebloans here at Acoma. And if the story is true that they wanted but weren't able to kill Oñate when he was there, I'm sure they were itching to take out the next group that arrived. And that next group just so happened to have been Oñate's nephew. And if the story is true that a Spanish soldier under Zaldivar took two turkeys and killed the owner before he himself was killed, whether in an exchange gone wrong or just flat out through theft and murder, that would have been the perfect reasoning behind the slaughter of Zaldivar's forces. Honestly, I can see quite clearly the actions on both sides as justified. But of course, I don't condone theft or murder or plundering or or actually especially war. But the Spanish are on the continent and they're on, they're in the hemisphere and they're in the hemisphere to stay. They are going to explore and they're going to expand their colony. And they're going to manifest destiny their lands to the north, just as the United States will later do to the west. It just so happens that those lands are the same. On the one hand, this is the Puebloans' home. And it has been since the Altai Thermal, which was thousands of years before this. And it was probably the Puebloans' land even before that, when it wasn't too hot to support mammalian life. The people who we call the ancestral Puebloans and Puebloans, they've been in North America since the ice wall thawed enough to allow them to pour into the continent, literally fall down. Some of them were here long before that, after they'd arrived on their boats on the coasts. These people had survived the giant beasts that had once roamed the land. They had survived excursions from down south before with the Mesoamericans and their Chaco Aztec Altepetl. They'd survived a civil war against their northern neighbors near Mesa Verde. Those same cousins who lived north of the San Juan River, but who now live near the Rio Grande and even at Jemez which is not too far from Akama, 
They may have thought the Spanish were another in a long line of foes that they could defeat, and who they were destined to defeat. Because, after all, this was their land. But unfortunately, it would not work out that way this time. After a volley of arrows from atop the mesa, which did kill two Spanish horses, the die had been cast. At three in the afternoon on January 22nd, the Spanish attacked. The battle would last two days, but the Akamans didn't stand a chance. Although, the first Spanish attack would fail to penetrate the top of the extremely fortified mesa. But the second attack, after night fell, that found Zaldivar's men separated into two throngs. One pushed up the northern fortified front, while Zaldivar, the Avenger, led eleven other soldiers up the southern uninhabited side to flank the Akamans. Once dug in, they then hoisted up, with what must have been great strength, uh, two, they hoisted up two cannons. I mean, by now the Puebloans know they're on the mesa, and they're dug in. So they're sending arrows and stones and taunts and all in the direction of these men who must defend themselves while simultaneously hoisting up two heavy cannons. And from the Puebloans' point of view, this must have seemed absolutely imperative that they block these Spaniard invaders. They could not allow them to hold a position on their mesa, the mesa they'd been on for over 400 years. But those two cannons which began firing on the morning of the 23rd, they were capable of throwing 200 balls per volley. They were basically like a scatter gun. And they absolutely obliterated the Akamans. They were defending that side of the town, but after the cannon blasts the northern side of the Pueblo, it became easier to overtake as the Puebloans ran to the south side to defend that place where the cannons had just shot. And then... Uh, the Spaniards in the north took up positions on the mesa top and set fire to the northern end of the Pueblo. So as night fell on the second day of the battle, and the cannons blasted, and the Pueblo burned, the Akamans asked for peace. What else could they have done? Zaldivar called for an end to hostilities. But that end of hostilities did include a gathering of captives, and in those captives was included the leaders of the Pueblo, the Spaniards would then hold them in their kivas, ladders up. But this did not go over well with the remaining Puebloans, and yet another, this time final, battle ensued. Kessel wrote of the end of the battle, quote, According to Spanish sources, the Akama men, sensing defeat, began to kill one another and their families rather than surrender. End quote. Again, you cannot blame either side, really. History is full of ambiguity and compromise, and it's always easy to judge from the future. After the second call for peace erupted, Zaldivar acquiesced and allowed the fighting to yet again stop. And despite him having previously commanded to give no quarter or take no prisoners. The devastation was total. Akama was, as Marquez had suggested it should be, nearly leveled. Possibly 800 Akamas were dead, which most assuredly can be chalked up to grape shot cannons and that fire which spread through the Pueblo. Every survivor, all 500 of them, were taken prisoner and then subsequently escorted to San Juan de los Caballeros, where they arrived on the 9th of February, 1599. The trial of the quote-unquote murderous rebels was led by Onyate, who, as Roberts puts, met out conquistadorial justice. Roberts goes on to write of the rest of the trial, quote, Every man over the age of 25 had his right foot cut off and was sentenced to 20 years slave labor. All the women above the age of 12 and all men from 12 to 25 likewise earned two decades of penal servitude. The children were taken from their parents and distributed as servants in Mexico. Two Indians from the distant Pueblo of Hopi, who had fought with the Akamas, had their right hands cut off. 
They were then sent home as a lesson to other potential rebels. End quote. Brutal and painful conquistadorial justice that would go on to intimidate and show the rest of the Puebloan world just like they'd intended, but it showed the Puebloans that the Spanish meant to stay. And by show the Puebloan world, I mean there were thousands of Puebloans and as many leaders as the Spanish could muster, and they were all brought in to watch the trial. Kessel again, quote, They probably did not understand the formalities of the trial the Spaniards recorded so diligently, but they saw the brutal results, end quote. Thirty years after the destruction and punishment of Acoma, the Pueblo was finally allowed to be rebuilt by the Acoma survivors and their descendants. You do have to wonder, though, how much the survivors could really help, being rather old by then and missing their right foot. Although, in Onyate's journal, he does mention a technicality that may have been overlooked by future historians. He mentions the toes of the right foot were cut off, not the entire foot. This, of course, is of no comfort to those who lost those precious digits. I also saw that it may not have been all the men over 25, uh, but possibly only 24 of those men over 25. But again, the number wasn't recorded properly, so the only thing recorded was that they had the toes of their right foot removed. The rebuilding of Akama was obviously accompanied by the construction of a grand, beautiful, and enormous church. This church, San Esteban del Rey, is 100 feet long and 35 feet tall, and it was built with massive 40-foot roof beams that were cut down from the slopes of Mount Taylor, and Mount Taylor sits just across I-40 from Sky City. While the Puebloans hoisted the wood to the spot of the church, the friars, under the command of a fray Juan Ramirez, did not allow the Puebloans to let the beams touch the ground for the entire journey, which was some 30 miles or so. Which kind of reminds me of the legend that the Kiva and Great Houses, those roof beams at Chaco and other places, they were carried without ever touching the ground either. This pattern of sending out the friars and priests to the Pueblos while the Spanish and the army stayed near the Rio Grande in Santa Fe or that area, that is replicated at every Pueblo in the region. The goal of this pattern was to separate the people and strengthen the intimidation factor of the Spanish rulers. Oñate demanded this separation himself, and he explicitly refused any settler from living too far from the center of power, and certainly not among the natives. He didn't want any intermarrying, mingling, or even mixing. The Spanish had to sit at Santa Fe and act from, as not wrote, the dominant more aloof position of patriarch, judge, and punisher among the Indians. End quote. In March of that year, after the trial, Oñate would request from New Spain more horses and settlers, and quote, married men who are the solid rock on which to build a lasting new nation. End quote. He had conquered New Mexico. Now it was time to rule it. Unfortunately, though, Oñate was a cruel and a harsh and a tough leader, or as one of his biographers puts it, a quote-unquote petty despot. The next eight years of his reign as governor are tinged with failure, conflict, and for him, deep troubles. Well, for him and the entire colony, and the Puebloans. Just deep troubles for the whole of New Mexico, really. To begin with, the land of enchantment can be quite disenchanting, especially to these first few settlers. The winters were unbearably harsh and cold, especially for people who came from a more temperate climate down south in Mexico. One man, Inez de Herrera Horta, wrote that the winters lasted eight months, and it was so cold that, quote, the river freezes over and the Spaniards are always shivering by the fire, end quote and wood for those fires were not close at hand, but it had to be carried in from the hills and mountains or brought up from nearby riverbanks. And the riverbanks were closest, but that meant you were burning cottonwood, and that meant smoke, and that meant misery. 
A Fray Alonso de Benavides would later write about the cold that, quote, Every winter a great number of Indians out in the country are found frozen, and many Spaniards have their ears, feet, and hands frozen, end quote. I believe he's referencing a frostbite. The land was also rugged and thorny, and the crops were stubborn to grow when they grew at all. Not to mention the lack of gold, silver, and any other precious ores. I mean, that truly disheartened many that believed they were going to strike it rich in this land of the north. In reality, the land was filled with, as not put it, abysmal poverty. Even the Puebloan tributes left something to be desired. The Puebloans mostly brought corn and blankets and not even enough for the Spanish, while at the same time, it was far too much for the Puebloans, who very much could have used every string, shred, and crumb they gave up. Actually, this problem of food goes back to before the Spanish even left New Spain. It turns out Oñate may have raided other settlers on their way north to New Mexico because they waited so long at the northern frontiers, they waited so long for actual permission that they ran dangerously low on supplies. And this would have a profound effect on them and ultimately the Puebloans. For the first three years that they were in New Mexico, the Spanish depended heavily on Puebloan food and clothing, which helps make more sense of why Zaldivar and his men were so violent in their begging for food at Acoma. There was such poor planning and so much bureaucracy, the true hallmarks of government, of course, but there was such poor planning, and they waited so long that the settlers showed up with far less than they should have, which ultimately, that doomed the relations between the settlers and the Puebloans. The Spanish, being unprepared, essentially forced them to steal and do so weakly. And to add insult to starving injury, the settlers, once they'd arrived, either didn't work hard enough in the beginning, or it really was as difficult as the settlers wrote about to actually get anything to grow. Not says of this hardship, quote, As a result, both the amount of tribute and the ruthlessness with which the Spanish settlers ensued its collection quickly escalated. End quote. That ruthlessness uh, sometimes included taking the clothing directly off the backs of the Puebloans. One friar even wrote of this terrible practice when he wrote, quote, It will suffice to say that during the winter when the inclemencies of heaven strike here more suddenly than in other inhabited countries, our men, with little consideration, took blankets away from the Indian women, leaving them naked and shivering with cold. Finding themselves naked and miserable, they embraced their children tightly in their arms to warm and protect them, without making any resistance to the offenses done to them, for they are a humble people, and in virtue and morality are the best behaved thus far discovered. End quote. Literally taking the clothing off the Puebloans' back isn't a good look for the Spanish. It's amazing the revolt doesn't happen sooner. But that goes to show the, the strength despite their lack of, well, everything, despite their lack of everything except violence. Also, I do love the phrase, during the winter when the inclemencies of heaven strike here more suddenly than in other inhabited countries. What a way to say that the winters are harsh and cold and snowy and they suck. Remember in the last episode when I talked about how hard it was to grow food in the Rio Grande Valley? That didn't change just because the Spanish arrived. And when they couldn't grow it themselves, like I just mentioned, and after they essentially legally stole maize and all manner of other foods from the Puebloans, the Spanish almost destroyed the balance that nearly 3,000 years of difficult cultivation had accomplished for the people. And that great drought of 1,300 or so hadn't really let up, and when it does, it just comes back. It's the Southwest. The place had become more arid, and the climate fluctuated a whole lot more than it had during the heyday of Chaco and Aztec. The valley, it barely produced enough food for the Puebloans. It definitely didn't produce enough for them and the Spanish invaders. <laughs> 
Thankfully, at first in those few years after the conquest, the Anasazi ancestral Pueblo in practice of keeping dried maize and quote-unquote granaries, those granaries that are the very famous masonry structures that inundate the Four Corners area, but are also found in the Jemez and uh, Santa Fe area, that practice of keeping stored corn grains, it saves the Puebloans and the Spanish. It saves all the peoples, European and local. It saves their bacon in 1600. But once those stores had dried up, things were going to turn even more sour. By the following year, things would get so bad for the Spanish that Captain Diego de Zubia, the purveyor general of Oñate's forces, he would later confess to plundering and stealing food from Puebloans just so his soldiers wouldn't perish from hunger. Not just steal and loot, though. He'd also confess to, as Knott wrote, quote, He was so desperate to find food lest the army perish that week that he tortured some Indians. The torture inflicted with exquisite pain led an Indian to confess where he had buried some maize in holes. End quote. In Pueblo Revolt, Roberts quotes a friar who would later abandon the territory completely. Quote, a Franciscan averred that, as the colony fell on lean times, Indian chiefs had been tortured and killed to force them to confess the whereabouts of secret stores of corn. Thousands of Indians, the friar went on, had already died of starvation. Now, this is the uh, the friar. They had been reduced to such extremity that he had seen them eating branches of trees, earth, charcoal, and ashes. End all quotes. Ah, that's branches of trees, earth, dirt, charcoal, ashes. In that same year of 1601, Captain Luis de Velasco accused Oñate himself of going, and here's not again. Oñate went, quote, in person to another pueblo to seize their maize, and as the Indians had concealed it in some small rooms, he ordered the walls torn down. When an Indian reproved the act by a word in his native tongue, the governor gave him a thrust and pushed him down the terrace. He fell on his back and was killed instantly, never moving hand or foot. End quote. So, Oñate pushed a Puebloan off his own roof, which broke his back and killed him, looking for his food. Velasco would also write, quote, the Indians fear so much that, on seeing us approach from afar, they flee to the mountains with their women and children, abandoning their homes, and so we take what we wish from them. End quote. It seems Oñate and all his men have forgotten the entreaties of the king to not harm the Puebloans. But starvation can do a lot. By the fall of 1601, Velasco said of the Puebloans that they could be seen near their precious river water's edge, quote, making holes shaped like cups and filling them with tomatoes mixed with sand and dirt and using it for food, as they had nothing else to live on. We had taken away from them by force what they had saved up for many years. End quote. The Puebloans were so hungry that women would follow the carts that the soldiers used to transport the stolen tribute back to the capital in the hopes of of getting a single colonel or cob that would fall off the back. Uh, other Indians, especially the mighty Tewa, who had come from the Mesa Verde and who would later initiate the revolt, but many Puebloans would offer themselves up as slaves just so their families could eat. New Mexico was proving to be a terribly difficult and heartbreaking land for the newly conquering Spanish and the conquered Puebloans. Not to pile on here, but then there's also the problem of the previously promised ocean. Oñate and many other Europeans believed the Pacific Ocean was just right there over the horizon, which would have truly helped facilitate more trade and settlers. If there was a port there, I mean... There were endless possibilities. At least that's what the Spanish thought. In reality, I live less than 20 miles from the Pacific Ocean in the Santa Ana Mountains, and Santa Fe is over 800 miles through some of the harshest Mojave landscapes and steep, rugged mountains you can imagine. Dry, steep, rugged mountains. 
Onyate would himself go in search of the Pacific, like I said earlier when I quoted his signature on the rocket El Morro, but he would only find the Gulf of California. He'd travel from Santa Fe to Zuni, then to Hopi, and then to the Little Colorado River, over to the Colorado River, which means he would have been traveling alongside that majestic Grand Canyon before taking that amazing river all the way down to the Gulf of California. At which point, he'd proclaim that he found a great harbor for Spanish ships and then turn around and come home. At the Gulf of California, though, he mistakenly thought that he was in fact at the Pacific Ocean, which is why California is drawn as a massive island in those early days, and which is why it's called California at all. Quick aside about the state I live in, at least for now, but the state of California was named after a mythical island that was in a popular novel at the time. The island in the novel was full of people led by a woman leader named Califia, as in like the Arabic word for caliphate, or which is, I guess, leader or kingdom. There are actually multiple theories on the origin of the name of the state, uh, but I thought it was pretty interesting. Before that expedition to the Sea of Cortez, though, in 1601, Onyate actually headed out onto the Great Plains, which is another place I know very well, because I spent 11 years there. If you know the Great Plains, or the area around it, you know it has its beauty. But uh, to drum up further colonists and money from the crown, Onyate told the Viceroy of New Spain, and the King of all of Spain, that... um, Well, he told them some flat-out lies. Kessel writes of this exaggeration like this, quote, On the plains to the east were untold multitudes of Cibola cattle, or bison, and great settlements of natives. Quote, It would be an endless story, he avowed, and now he's quoting Onyate, to attempt to describe in detail each one of the many things that are found there. All I can say is that with God's help, I am going to see them all and give to His Majesty more pacified worlds, new and conquered, greater than the good Marquis, who is Cortez, gave him. If your lordship but gives me the succor, favor, and aid I expect from such a generous hand. End quote. That is quite the request. On that trip to the Buffalo Kingdom, Onyate would take 130 Spanish soldiers, 12 friars, and 130 Indian warriors and servants, which is a large party. Why was he scouring the Great Plains? Not to look for gold, of course. The seven cities of Cibola turned out to be bogus, but surely the grand city of Quivira was true, right? That place that Coronado was looking for before realizing he was duped and then had the Turk corroded. Onyate wouldn't find that city of gold either, but he would run into quite a few Native American tribes, including the fierce Apache. He'd also praise the as tall as a horse prairie grass and comment on how much better the soil was out there than in New Mexico. He's not wrong. But he's still just trying to sell the land northwards to anyone. Anyone at all who feels like colonizing it. In Oklahoma, Onyate would run into a group called the Eskenakis before running into another group called the Rayados. He liked the Rayados better, he wrote, but he kidnapped their leader anyways. He kidnapped a man named Caratax. Although he would say he treated him well. Man, these conquistadors... Eventually, he would turn his expedition around as the various peoples began to amass armies on the horizon. I wonder why. You took their leader, duh. Oh, and he took some women and children as well, most likely to sell or use in Santa Fe. On their way back to New Mexico, the Escanakis would attack them. Those warriors would free care attacks, and the Spanish would let the women and children, or at least most of them, go. The battle lasted only two hours. It's believed today that the Eskenakis and the Briados were probably Caddoan Wichita Indians of Oklahoma and Kansas. But this series of events of running into Native Americans and kidnapping a few women and children before skirmishes broke out, that would happen for, oh, the next 80 years or so, and it would be a contributing factor to 1680. During this Great Plains expedition, The aforementioned new settlers that Onyate had asked for, which had arrived, 
and which counted around 73. Well, a bunch of them, and even a bunch of original colonists as well, they all collectively decided to heck with this place. They probably, at least rightfully so, felt like they had been lied to, and nothing was as advertised. So while the big guy was out gallivanting around the Buffalo Kingdom, they, numbering a full two-thirds of the entire colony, packed up and headed down to Mexico. They did that despite the accusation that could be leveled against them of desertion, which was a steep accusation. And I guess I don't know how this style of colony works if leaving because it sucks can get you in trouble for desertion with the law. But they took a chance with it. Once in a place called Nueva Galicia, which is now a bunch of states in central west Mexico, but once at Nueva Galicia, they told the ex-governor about all the bad stuff, including the provisions, the water, food, and lack of wood. The ex-governor of Nueva Galicia then wrote to the viceroy of New Spain. He wrote to convey these hardships, which included the fact that the land of enchantment was, quote, lacking people and silver. It lacks woods, pastures, water, and suitable land. And then he later writes, Your lordship should take pity on them, for their lack of clothing, food, and horses forces them to seek relief. End quote. One of the friars that had come down with the refugees, oh, I forgot to mention, every single friar actually came down with the refugees except three. Only three friars stayed behind in all of New Mexico, which means every single Pueblo was abandoned by the church. Every mission and church now sat empty, which only fueled further confusion for the Puebloans. If the Spanish were really that strong, why'd they leave? Weren't they our conquerors? And think about the Puebloans who had been baptized and actually converted and believed it. They must have felt truly betrayed and fearful of losing their lives, which we'll get into a little bit later. One of those friars who had fled wrote, quote, The suffering of their women and children, the plagues of bedbugs and lice, the unbearable cold of winter, the sullen looks of the Indians, how they despised this place. They had a saying about New Mexico, Ocho meses de invierno y cuatro de infierno. Eight months of winter, and four of hell. End quote. Obviously, it's better in Spanish because winter and hell rhyme. He could be referring to the heat, or he could be referring to the fact that the place sucked, or both. Another friar told the lieutenant governor of New Mexico at the time, quote, If we stay any longer, the natives and all of us here will perish of hunger, cold, and nakedness. End quote. As would be expected, when Oñate returned and found the place nearly empty of Spanish, of his Spanish, he was pissed. After he learned of these settlers' betrayal, he sent his loyal Vicente Zaldivar and some soldiers down south to catch the deserters, and when they caught them, to kill them. But not just kill, behead the quote-unquote traitors. Thankfully, the soldiers were a bit too late. They never did catch them deserters. It's at this point, Spain actually thinks about shutting the entire enterprise down. The reports coming out from deserters and priests and from spies, because the viceroy of New Spain had spies amongst the camp. All these reports were pretty damning towards Oñate and his merry band of conquista thugs. Not to mention, the whole affair was costing just so much money. Sure, the Americas were supplying the Spanish crown with buku gold, but they were also spending ungodly amounts on that northern territory. They were also losing a bunch to pirates. The rest of Europe was beginning to encroach. And frankly, New Mexico wasn't making them a cent. There were no seven cities of gold. Heck, there weren't one cities of gold. Not amongst the Pueblos. Not amongst the infinite grasslands, nowhere was there gold to be found in the territory of New Mexico or its neighboring lands. The only thing worth saving at all, or that made the endeavor even remotely worth it, was the treasure of souls that the church had converted. And surprisingly, in the end, that was the deciding factor. Even if that number was embarrassingly small... <laughs> 
Eventually, the Spanish crown decided that they could not, in good faith or conscience, leave the converted Puebloans without the presence of the church. They couldn't allow the converts' souls to rot. That, and a few intelligent friars noted that as soon as the Spanish were gone, all the baptized Puebloans who were absolutely in the minority would most likely be killed by their Indian brethren. And you'll see in the next episode, that was quite the prescient assumption. Actually, in 1601, a rumor that the Spanish were going to indeed flee the scene began to spread among the Puebloans, which caused quite a few of the baptized Native Americans to head for the hills in fear. The strategic position of New Mexico also played a role, though. The vast territory essentially acted as a barrier to the ever-encroaching other European powers. I mean, they were advancing towards the quite prosperous mines of northern Mexico. Plus, the area might eventually be a nice jumping-off point to explore even further into North America. So, ultimately, in 1609, it was reluctantly decided that the Spanish had to hold on to the fledgling and seemingly failing colony of New Mexico. But something should probably be done about that uh, Oñate. For his part, Oñate realized in 1608 that his time was up, and that he'd probably most certainly failed at following the king's commands on how to act towards the people there, both colonists and Puebloans. And the fleeing of two-thirds of the colony certainly helped persuade him of his mistakes. So in February of 1608, he resigned. Instead of a two-week notice, though, it ended up being a two-year notice. Eventually, he would finally be replaced as governor, and that replacement's name was Pedro de Peralta. But uh, more on him in a bit, because Oñate's troubles aren't over yet. Once back in New Spain, the viceroy hit him with 30 formal charges of misconduct and lawbreaking. Roberts writes this of the court's findings. Of the 30 counts, Oñate was eventually convicted on 12. These included the murder of several deserters, robberies committed by his soldiers, the giving of glowing accounts of the land when it was really poor, living shamefully with women in the colony, and most damningly, the brutal treatment of the Indians of Akuma. End quote. After all that Oñate had sacrificed, and bled for, and fought for, and surely damned his soul for, after all the hard work and the murders and the pain and the frustration, after all the time and money he spent, Oñate was sentenced to banishment from New Mexico and four years of exile in Mexico City. At 80 years old, Oñate would ask the king of Spain to lift his banishment in exile. I don't believe his request was granted. Roberts says of Oñate's end, quote, The last conquistador died in obscurity back in Spain in 1625. End quote. Obviously, the Puebloans were sure glad to see him go. Uh, the Puebloans of today actually still want him gone, for his presence is continuing to haunt the land. Well, maybe not anymore. In 1992, a statue of him... A pretty cool statue of him, honestly. But before I get taken out of context, I do not condone Oñate or his actions, and I think the term petty despot is particularly accurate. But in 1992, a cool and an expensive statue, expensive for the taxpayers of New Mexico, by the way, but the statue of Oñate was erected and placed in that year, not far from where he set up his home base. But in 1998... On the 400th anniversary of the conquering of New Mexico, a group of Indian activists who called themselves the Brothers of Akama, in the dead of night, rather fittingly, cut off Oñate's right foot. For ten grand, he had a new one a week later, again at the expense of the taxpayers, of course. That new right foot was painted red in 2017 with the words, Remember 1680, written at the base of the monument. Then in 2020, during the horrific riots and fiery violence that swept the United States during that troubling summer, a group called Red Nation, a group of Indian activists, called for a demonstration against the very hated Oñate statue. 
So to avoid the fate of too many other ill-led cities around the country at that time, the county of Rio Arriba just removed it to an undisclosed location, where I believe it still sits today. There is no doubt Oñate's crimes were many, and I don't blame the Puebloans for wanting all traces of him gone. But history cannot and should not be erased. It's always better to learn from it than to ignore it. Hopefully I'm helping y'all learn some of that history. Before we leave this early time period of the initial conquering in the New Mexico dust, we should point out one more failure of that last conquistador that was Oñate. Other than gold and silver and food and ports and beasts, Oñate promised a ton of souls. He promised the church and the king that the Puebloans would convert en masse. But instead, baptism in 1602 in all of New Mexico were 60 to 70 Native Americans. Period. By 1605, that number was a paltry 500. In 1607, it was 700. Still, nowhere near the number the last conquistador had sworn would convert. I mean, when the Spanish would reach a pueblo, one of the first things they would do was build a mission or church directly over the pueblo's kiva, very often destroying the old one in the process. Roberts wrote, quote, Usually, the new mission obliterated the villagers' most important kivas, thus stamping the superiority of the Catholic over the Kachina religion into the very architecture. End quote. It's no wonder only a few converted at first, but that number would slowly rise, which probably had to do with the fact that the converted Puebloans were awarded with the food stores that the Spanish had stolen from their very own Pueblos. Also, if you were a baptized Puebloan who worked for the church, and such jobs as bell ringing or cooking or tending field or even laundry or any other myriad of jobs the friars dished out to the Indians, if you were working for the church, you didn't have to pay tribute. So some Puebloans chose the church for food and protection and for the avoidance of having to pay tribute. All of this, though, it helps lead to the destruction of the Puebloans being able to feed themselves. And this destruction of the Puebloans' ability to feed themselves also destroyed their ties with their northern Athabascan neighbors, primarily those Navajo and Apache Indians, who were increasingly encroaching, and violently so. Not only would the Puebloan neighbors attack the Indians who converted, but also Indian neighbors within one's own Pueblo were quite hostile to those who were baptizing converted. This even further pushed the converted Puebloans into the protection of the Spanish. Throughout the next 80 years, even the Puebloans who did not convert or get baptized were punished for practicing their own religions by the friars. And those who were baptized, they were punished severely. I remember, the only Spaniards at the Pueblos were the friars and priests, and them friars saw everything. And they didn't mind dishing out some spiritual justice. It's amazing that the people's culture and religion in the Kachinas survived the Spanish at all. But it also makes more sense how it survived so much better at the Hopi Mesas than the Rio Grande Pueblos. The more Spanish there were, and the closer to Santa Fe the Pueblo was, the more their culture was ultimately suppressed, and the more the Puebloans would paradoxically become dependent upon the Europeans for survival. Which is why, after many raids from their Indian neighbors, in 1608, 7,000 Puebloans would get baptized by the Spanish. Now, that number may have been made up for the sole purpose of persuading the crown to keep the colony alive, Still, many Puebloans would refuse to get baptized or convert, or as one Humano Puebloan put it, turn crazy. I mean, the strange self-flagellation, the kissing of the friars' hands and feet, the sentencing to death or dismemberment only to be pardoned by the friars at the last minute. These things were quite unattractive to the Puebloans. I, again, I can't help but think they had a civil war against the Chaco Aztec Altepetl over these very same things. 
the Puebloans after the Anasazi would leave and go down south? The Puebloans would seemingly, although as I mentioned last time, it's more complicated than it appears, and I could be wrong, but after the migration, the Puebloans seemingly abandoned hierarchy and adopted the Kachinas and extreme humility in order to bind the people together, and also as a direct reaction against the Altapetl they'd forced south after the war, that Altapetl that had ruled over them. Yet now, with their church and their hierarchy and their laws and punishments and their thieving, the Spanish were doing the same thing, just with less heart-taking. Oh, and those bells. The church bells rang so much all the time for everything. The Puebloans hated those bells. During the revolt, with the exception of one at Acoma, Every single bell is seemingly smashed and dashed into a hundred pieces. Many of these people who rejected Catholicism would flee from the closer pueblos near Santa Fe and head out to the periphery, or to the rugged mountain pueblos like the Jemez, where the Spanish had much less control, or even to the newly rebuilt Acoma, or possibly way out west at the Hopi Mesas, but also at the Zuni Pueblo, and more on that one in uh, just a little bit. After Oñate was kicked out of New Mexico, the new governor, Pedro de Peralta, would bring with him a dozen more soldiers and eight more friars, which would bring the number of Spaniards in the territory to a paltry 221 people, or thereabouts. Which truly surprised me. That is just so few Spaniards. It is amazing they maintained control over the territory at all. Robert's account of Peralta's governorship is filled with fantastic details of a rivalry he, the governor, had with a rather oily and shady liar of a friar named Ordonez, a man who had twice already been in the territory of New Mexico and was there this time to ultimately keep control of the land and its people in the clutches of the church once and for all. The story is complete with Peralta regulating the mistreatment of Puebloans to hinder the church being able to work, which, yes, that sounds nice, but it was purely for selfish reasons for Peralta. There's also Ordonez, the friar, forging documents and comparing himself to the Pope. During a scuffle, Peralta would accidentally shoot a friar and a soldier, probably on accident. This would result in the excommunication of Peralta, who again was the governor and leader of the territory of New Mexico. And Peralta would also, on order of the friar, be arrested. Ordonez would have him imprisoned for nine months, which, as Roberts put it, made the friar Ordonez the supreme leader of New Mexico. Before the scuffle with and arrest of Peralta, Ordonez would say at the pulpit during church, quote, Do not be deceived. Let no one persuade himself with vain words that I do not have the same power and authority that the Pope in Rome has, or that if his holiness were here in New Mexico, he could do more than I. Believe you that I can arrest, cast into irons, and punish as seems fitting to me any person without exception who is not obedient to the commandments of the church and mine. What I have told you, I say for the benefit of a certain person who is listening to me, who perhaps raises his eyebrows. End quote. That certain person, Peralta, would soon find that he... Ordonez was uh, not bluffing. All of this, it no doubt confused the heck out of the Puebloans even further. They already had a strained relationship with the church, and this probably further made them lose some faith in their new overlords. I mean, the area of New Mexico almost erupted into European civil war multiple times. On the other hand, the Puebloans, as Knott writes in Pueblo Revolt, the Puebloans, quote, 
proved to be quite adept at recognizing the significance of strife within the Hispanic community and manipulating events to their own advantage. In the process, they exhibited a Pueblo heritage with the strength to weather more than three generations of Spanish rule in the 17th century, and the patience to await the day when New Mexico would be returned to the hands of its oldest inhabitants. End quote. No surprise, Ordonez would also prove to be a crummy, petty despot of a ruler, with one colonist complaining about life in New Mexico by saying, quote, Existence in the villa was a hell. End quote. Despite the fact that a new governor had been sent from Spain, Ordonez would stay in power for another two and a half years, and he only left the position of de facto supreme leader when the Catholic Church invented an entirely new position just for him. Roberts sums up the whole sad affair when he writes. Much of this prolonged struggle between prelate and governor reads today as bad comedy. Yet, if Ordonez's tyranny turned the colony into a veritable hell for the settlers, it had an even more lugubrious impact on the Puebloans. On hearing that a Cochiti man had been murdered by Indians from Jemez, Ordonez sent soldiers to seize the alleged perpetrators and bring them to Santo Domingo. There, he had one Jemez man hanged on the spot and ordered the execution of the others. The latter sentences may not have been carried out, but they set the mold for a fierce resentment of the Spanish on the part of the Jemez, which would only grow more bitter over the next 65 years. End quote. These struggles between the government and the church within the community of the Spanish colonists, these struggles would continue all the way up until the revolt. Most of the blame for that, though, it lays with the king and his decision to ultimately save the colony of New Mexico. Once he did that, which he did for mostly religious reasons, it was decided that the land was a vineyard for the Lord, not for the king or his treasury. This ultimately gave tremendous power to the friars in the church, with the only check on their power being the governor. Yet, the governors wanted what power the church had, and the church wanted the civil authority, what little it was, that the governor had. The church could investigate Catholics intimately and threaten people with excommunication and the withholding of the sacrament, and the governor could arrest or fine the citizens. Between the years 1610 and 1670, three governors angered the church so much so that they were excommunicated while they were governor, and two of them actually stood trial in front of the Inquisition in Mexico City. And the Inquisition could influence whether you continued to breathe or not. And during that time, four governors, including the aforementioned Peralta, were imprisoned while governor. It turns out the church leaders also had the ability to jail the civil leaders. The fourth governor, Juan de Ulate, in 1618 arrived to the region, a region already shaky between church and state, and he inflamed it even more. Ulate, a lifelong military man, did not, under no uncertain circumstances, care for the church at all. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure... From what I read and from what other people said, he hated it. He called the priests lazy men who only eat and sleep. He claimed that, despite what the church says, there are no witches or sorcerers. They were only saying that there were witches and sorcerers so that the church could be nosy and spy on their fellow men while also extracting punishment, which they really enjoyed doing. Sometimes, Ulate would say things in front of Indians and soldiers and other settlers, which humiliated and infuriated the friars. Then, and Ulate put a halt to the building of many of the churches that were already underway, including the massive church at Pecos. He did this on the claim that the demands on the Puebloans themselves, who were doing the work, of course, was inhumane. Which, sure, yeah, but this was more of a way to get to the friars than to relieve the burden that laid on the Puebloans' backs. Ulate also encouraged the Puebloans to practice their Kachina cult. His hate for the church knew no bounds, honestly. In 
At one point, he claimed that, quote, the king was his ruler and he did not have to acknowledge the authority of the pope or the church, end quote. He also spread word that the Puebloans, citing some obscure Spanish law, which helps ease the transition into Christianity, but Ulate spread around that the people didn't even have to go to Mass anymore, or listen to the priests at all. Did Ulate love the Indians? Well, he would later face charges in Mexico City of going on slave raids against the Navajo and Apache. And even more alarming, he was also charged with kidnapping orphaned children from among the various pueblos, and either selling them in Mexico, or allowing his patrons to use them as house servants. Not exactly a champion of the people. His actions did encourage the government in New Spain to issue decrees limiting the number of Puebloans who could be forced to work at one time. So that's good. And it even said that they, the Puebloans had to be paid from now on for their work. So this power play, it further eroded the church's ability to stamp out the Puebloans' cultural practices, especially the all-important Kachinas. Eventually, the friars would excommunicate Governor Ulate and threatened to completely abandon the territory and this quote-unquote antichrist. All of this also helped further the violence that would erupt in the 1620s. In 1621, Fray Martin de Arvide at Picurus Pueblo was smacked upside the head with a war club and then dragged around the Pueblo... And this all happened because he baptized the medicine man's son without the medicine man's permission. He would survive this little smackdown, and then he would flee the area. And Picurus Pueblo wouldn't see another Catholic for seven years, planting the seed that violence may work to intimidate the priests after all. Also in that year of 1621, a Fray Jerónimo de Zarate Salmaron would reach the Jemez Pueblo, convert quite a few of the Jemez, and even build a church in the mountain stronghold Pueblo. But only two years later, in 1623, the Jemez would burn it down and run back into the rugged mountains around them. At the Hopi Mesas, a Fray Francisco Letrado was also smacked upside the head by a war club many, many times. He would not survive his smackdown. Five days later, the aforementioned Arvide, who he himself had been smacked upside the head, well, he came to the Pueblo of Zuni only to find they'd killed his buddy. After letting the priest in and allowing him to feel comfortable, though, the Zuni killed him by shooting him with a Spanish arquebus, which is pretty hardcore. After that murder... The Zuni Puebloans would flee en masse to their Mesa top refuge known as Doa Yelani, and they would escape what they knew would be Spanish justice. It came, but the soldiers couldn't do anything against the natural defenses of the Mesa top refuge, so they left. In 1635, the people would finally go back to their low lying Pueblos. The Spanish wouldn't return to Zuni until the mid 1640s. Again, Violence appeared to get results for the Puebloans. In reality, most of the Pueblos were left alone on a day-to-day -day basis by both the Spanish and the priests. The year 1656 saw the most number of friars in the entire area at one time, and that number was surprisingly low at only 46. The language barrier was also an impediment to the Spanish, who frankly refused to learn any of the Puebloan languages. You'd think they'd at least try and learn the language of the people they're trying to convert. My father learned Mandarin in a few months in Salt Lake before he spent nearly two years in Taiwan in the 80s. My brother learned Cantonese before he spent two years in Hong Kong. My childhood friend from Georgia was actually sent to Santa Fe in that area, and he preached among the Puebloans, speaking Spanish and I think a few Puebloan words. I, I should ask him. It's crazy to think these friars lived in these places until they died, or at least until they fled back south as refugees, and they just never learned the language. How effective can that really be? So for the most part, in most areas of the Pueblo world, the Kachina cult in Kivas continued to be used. <laughs> 
More violence would periodically erupt, though. In 1639, at Taos, the Tiwa governor, by the name of Francisco, was caught at a kachina dance wearing the robes of a priest who had recently been murdered at the Pueblo. Along with the priest, two Spanish settlers had also been killed, and the murderers actually made their way to Picurus afterwards to continue the murders. But the friar there was warned and got away. Years later, Francisco would again be accused of murdering another friar, also at Taos. The Spanish governor at the time would investigate the second murder, but would ultimately not punish anyone because it came to light that the friar was abusive. Francisco was ultimately, at least probably, but was ultimately hanged for his earlier crimes. Of course, the reality of Christianity and the Puebloans is a nuanced and layered conversation in history, but it is worth noting that Christianity was occasionally appreciated and sometimes, especially during times of plenty and times of rain, but sometimes it was more readily accepted than in others. The Puebloans had a real appreciation for reciprocal gift-giving, and it was a hallmark of their culture prior to the Spanish, and of course, it would survive the Spanish. And Christianity was viewed as one of those gifts they accepted. The Puebloans could see how important it was to the colonizers, so their sharing of it was understood as a form of gift-giving in and of itself. The Spanish also gave the Puebloans technology and foods that they used even after the coming revolt, despite Pope commanding they forsake them. But the real problem with the reciprocal part of gift-giving is that from the very beginning with Coronado, the Spanish were mostly on the side of taking and not giving. Even Esteban may have been killed because he asked for too much and gave too little. The Spanish seemed to take everything from food and clothing to technology themselves. The Puebloans even taught the Spanish how to build adobe-type homes. Now, the Puebloan women were the home builders in their society, but they still taught the Spanish men to construct better homes in the harsh New Mexican environment. They also taught the Spanish about medical care. In the colony, and really much of Europe at this time, the church, especially the friars and priests, they were the doctors. And these priests just loved bloodletting. Headache? Bloodletting. Stomach ache? Let's cut you open and bleed you dry. So when the Puebloans were witness to using plants in the world around them to heal their ailments, the Spanish colonists would sneak away and seek their help. A similar thing happened all over the New World, honestly. You just had to make sure no friar saw you, and that no one was a snitch. Even in Europe at this time, or around 1500 to 1660, in many deep valleys or dark woods, in many villages far from city centers and big Christian churches, a lot of townsfolk would go and seek help and remedies from the far-flung places that held on to the pagan ways of old Europe. Consequently, during this time of 1500 to 1660, it's estimated that some 80,000 witches were executed on the continent. I'm not sure the Spanish were executed in New Mexico, if and they were discovered, but it was certainly frowned upon, and excommunication or the Inquisition could await your future. So Christianity wasn't always as reviled as it would come to be at the time of the revolt, but certainly when times were rough for the Puebloans, they blamed the Catholic religion and those brown robes. In 1637, the new governor, Luis de Rosas, would take over and further flame the fires of Puebloan and Spanish hardships and strife amongst themselves and each other. But he'd also allow a lot of Puebloan autonomy to slip in as well. For one thing, like Ulate, Rosas hated the friars. He went so far as standing up in the middle of a sermon one time and calling the priest a liar in front of a packed church. What he actually said was, quote, Shut up, Father, what you say is a lie. End quote. At Pecos, Rosas made a deal with the leaders of the Pueblo that if they brought him tribute instead of to the church and the friars, he'd let them practice their old religion 
and even choose their own Kachina captains. The murder of those aforementioned priests at Taos, the friars absolutely blamed that incident on Governor Rosas. He would go on to close sweatshops being run by the friars, and he would disallow the use of Puebloan labor at the missions. Period. No more Indian slave labor. Obviously, this was unacceptable to the priests. After some revolts by the Spanish against Rosas, which saw over half the soldiers side against him, he would force all church officials out of Santa Fe. And then a couple months later, when two priests returned to the city for whatever reason, he whipped him upside the head with a cane. In 1641, the Franciscan friars drafted a letter and sent it around New Mexico. In that letter, they accused Rosas of being a Calvinist. Oh, not a Calvinist. And allowing the Puebloans at Santa Fe to whip the statue of Jesus. Okay, well, that is a pretty bad offense. Eventually, Rosas was excommunicated, arrested, and jailed. But he would not survive his time in jail. He'd actually be assassinated by being stabbed by a soldier while in his cell. The perpetrator claimed he'd found his wife hiding under Rosas' bed after the soldier returned from service. Later, though, eight other soldiers were also convicted and then beheaded. And all of this did not help the Puebloans trust the church or the state, nor did it bolster the number of converts. But the times were only going to get more rough. In the 1640s, a terrible smallpox epidemic swept through the Pueblos and killed an estimated 3,000 Indians, which is a horrible amount of people. And at the same time, a punishing and prolonged drought settled onto the land, as it so often does in the American Southwest. All of this the infighting and assassinations and beatings and deals with the Puebloans and the hardships, the disease, all of it made it incredibly difficult to still believe in the Catholic magic that the friars were trying to sell the Puebloans. So, with the help of Rosas' relaxation, the people brought back what they knew and what they trusted, and the Kachina cult began to be revived. The Puebloans, they got so brazen about repracticing the Kachina, that they even danced and chanted with their masks and costumes right out in the open, right in front of the priests and friars. This had a predictable outcome, which left the Puebloans severely punished. One Hopi Puebloan was brutally flogged after he was caught quote-unquote worshipping idols. He was beat so bad that he was described as being bathed in blood. Regardless of the severity of his injuries, the priest who carried out the sentence poured hot turpentine in the wounds. He would die from his punishment. At Taos, there were rumors of another priest who punished the wicked Puebloan children with castration and sodomy. That same priest would also father a child with a Puebloan woman, and then pull a David from the Old Testament and have that woman's husband killed. He then had the soldiers who did the murder for him hanged. And also 40 more Puebloans were hanged for blasphemy and idol worship under him. 29 Puebloans were hanged at Jemez during the crackdown against the Kachina cult. Their crime was allegedly aiding and abetting the enemy Navajo and Apache, but that may have just been some pretense. The Puebloans weren't happy about the church either, obviously. (laughs) An intense feeling was beginning to percolate under the surface between the younger Christianized Indians and the older conservative Puebloans, who were holding on to their old beliefs. Roberts describes this uneasy tension when he writes, quote, There were instances in which the traditionalists seized half-breed children fathered by concupiscent friars and beat them to death. End quote. Concupiscent means lustful. Roberts loves to use big words. Then in 1659, 
the 19th governor would arrive and enact surprisingly enlightened reforms. That governor's name is Bernardo Lopez de Mendizabal, and long before he was governor, he had lived quite the life. Mendizabal was born in Mexico. He studied arts and law, and then served as a soldier. When he went back to church law, though, after soldiering, his family forbade him to continue, but probably dodging a bullet there. So instead, he rejoined the military, where he served as a soldier, judge, and even a governor. He served in South America, he served on ships at sea, he was a military mayor and a war captain. The man was respected, intelligent, and ready to lead New Mexico. How hard can that be, after all, right? None of those things made him immune to what the power and position of the leader of that far-flung province led men to, though. At first, he was, as others, active in the slave trade. He enjoyed the fruits of Pueblo and manual labor. He hunted Apaches, and to top it all off, he would send out Puebloans and Indians with carts full of the fruits of their own labor to far-off places in southern Mexico after he had made the sale so that they could be delivered. These Indians were delivering the goods that he'd already sold. And then he would just leave them there, stranded far to the south in a land they knew nothing about. Yet, at the same time, one of the very first things he did as governor was pass a law that would double the wage of a Puebloan laborer, and he further lowered the amount of work that could be hoisted upon them. Not rights of Mindizabal's written justification of his law change by citing the common knowledge, quote, of the tyranny with which the Indians of New Mexico were generally used, end quote. He goes on to write, but an outcry among the Hispanic settlers was inevitable, end uh, all quotes. This, again, wasn't maybe necessarily done out of the kindness of his heart, but because he wanted the church to have less control in the territory. But, that being said, it is important to know that his mom was half indigenous, which made him a fourth indigenous, so maybe he had a soft spot for his distant Puebloan cousins. I'm not sure of his true intentions, and writings from this later time period are apparently hard to come by. I haven't personally searched uh, the archives, but as deep in research as this podcast over this epic and sprawling event of the conquest and the ruling and eventual revolt in New Mexico is, I did not go out and read first-hand accounts from the Spanish or the Puebloans. Well, I'm not writing the new definitive history of the event, after all, unless a publisher wants to pay me for that. From what I can tell, Governor Mendizabal came to the region and he immediately set out to get some personal gain, like every single other governor assigned to the area has done and will do. But at the same time, he enacted his changes to the laws and the relaxation of the Puebloans to help ease their suffering. The man had traveled the world, honestly, and what he saw in New Mexico probably angered and saddened him. Compared to other Spanish outposts in the New World, if I haven't made it clear already, New Mexico was a backwater hellhole, not just to the people who were assigned the territory, but also to the people who were already living there. Constant droughts, fear from the Puebloans, civil strife between church and state, it was a nightmare. As many governors before him had also noticed, and it wasn't hard to equate that nightmare with the stranglehold the church had on its parishioners, their non-believing neighbors, and even the land itself. The church took all choice farmland. It took choice plots to build the church buildings. It took choice animals sent up from Mexico. And it took choice crops and textiles from the people to keep in their storehouses. And yes... The Chaco Aztec Altipetl probably did the same thing in the great houses as the church is doing at this time. But, I mean, we saw how that worked out in the end with the Anasazi Civil War in the 1200s and those Anasazi heading down south. There's a good chance 
The same thing happens in 1680 with the Spanish. There's some foreshadowing. About those choice plots of land the church occupied, Mendizabal absolutely resented that the friars owned and worked those plots with Puebloan labor. Here's a great extended quote from Knott, which will also quote the governor himself. Try to keep it uh, clear for you. He clearly resented the clergy's monopoly over labor in those pueblos in which missions were located. As evidenced in a letter from the governor to Fray Diego de Santander, dated July 20th, 1660. In response to Santander's charges that he was not cooperating in an effort to Christianize the pueblos, Lopez de Mendizabal replied that although he did not know the extent to which the Indians understood the Christian faith, he was quite sure that they did know how, quote, to guard and herd an infinite number of livestock to serve as slaves and to fill barns with grain cultivated and harvested with their own blood, not for their humble homes, but for those of the friar, end quote. Later, the governor would offer his opinion that, quote, it cannot be to the interest of divine worship that the friars should keep the Indians in dungeons and workshops weaving frieze and sackcloth to be sold there and sent to other provinces for which they maintain the shops right in the convents, and all quotes. To battle the ease with which the churches used Puebloan manual labor, Mendizabal would next do away with the practice of exempting the Indians who had converted and were baptized from paying further tribute. So now, everyone had to pay tribute to the Spanish. Instead of working for the church, they had to work to produce enough for themselves and for the tribute that they still owed the crown and the governor. Mendizabal would go on to call the friars at best drunken fools. He truly detested the Catholics and their stranglehold in New Mexico, and he was surprisingly harsh and brutal against them. Almost as harsh and brutal as to the friars as the friars had been to their parishioners, the Puebloans. Mendizabal then went on a grand tour of the Pueblo, as all governors did, but this time it was mainly a fact-finding venture to gather complaints against the clergy, which he actively encouraged the retelling of these complaints by the people. Not writes of this tour, quote, During one of these sessions in the Pueblo of Alamillo, Lopez de Menizabal listened to the accusations of a native woman against the resident friar, a man ninety years old, claiming that the priest had engaged in sexual relations with her and then denied the woman a prearranged payment. The governor forced the friar to pay the woman her claims, an event that caused all the Indians of that pueblo, both men and women and other persons who went with Lopez de Menizabal and saw the circumstance, to laugh immoderately as if ridiculing the minister. End quote. Another oft heard complaint was like that last accusation. Many of the Puebloan women claimed they stopped going to confession because while in the booth the priests would solicit for sexual favors. One friar at the Pueblo of Tahique was alleged to have slept with forty of his parishioners. Another at Taos had slept with a woman and then cut her throat, and then had another friar bury her somewhere in the church. Menizabal himself wrote of that crime. The governor himself told the story of the arrest of Fray Luis Martinez, for this friar having committed the execrable f- crime of forcing a woman, cutting her throat, and burying her in an office or cell in the convento of Los Taos. Lopez de Menizabal reported the case to the prelate and asked him to take proper measures, lest Fray Luis Martinez commit another crime, he having returned to those pueblos, or lest the Indians there should kill him in revolt, as they did on another occasion because of an event like this. The investigation of the case was made at the request of the Indians, for Fray Juan Lobato had buried the body of the dead woman in the church, having taken it from the cell or office, secretly so that it may not be known." That is a medieval church intrigue if I've ever heard any, and also very abhorrent actions. Eventually, after he learned of the friar who'd slept with 40 women and fathered a child with a married woman, 
and then he learned of the sham trial afterwards, Mendizabal would stop the power of the friars from handing down excommunications, one of their biggest threats and tools. The church would write to New Spain and declare that if they didn't get help soon, they were leaving. All of them, every friar was leaving. Indeed, many did actually already leave their churches and missions. And this caused those churches and missions to be abandoned by the converted Puebloans. At some Pueblos, there wasn't a single Christian showing up to Mass. Again, this was great for the Puebloans who didn't want the church there. But don't be mistaken, Mendizabal was absolutely getting his fill of money and goods and had no qualms using Puebloans to achieve it for himself. Even still, Mendizabal would go on to do the seemingly unthinkable. After receiving many requests from the Puebloans to lift the ban on Kachina dances, and then he himself watching a Kachina dance, and finding, quote-unquote, nothing devilish, he actually granted general permission for the Puebloans to perform their Kachina dances throughout the Pueblo world. But only if they performed them above ground in the plaza, and not in their dark kivas. Almost immediately, the Pueblo world of New Mexico and Arizona erupted in riotous and happy Kachina dances as quickly as the word could spread. Older Puebloans returned from self-appointed exile to teach the old dances to the youngsters. Even Spaniards were seen and witnessed dancing with the Puebloans long into the night, for many nights, by many a friar, who were obviously appalled. But to make matters worse, some of these quote-unquote rowdy Spaniards would head to their own homes afterwards and continue to dance the Kachina dances except in various states of undress, and right outside in the open. Oh my goodness. I mean, the people were clearly elated. The Puebloans and apparently the Spaniards. And the friars could do nothing about it. At least, for a little while. In the spring of 1661, a new head friar, Fray Alonso de Posadas, had been sent up from New Spain and he was not about to let this heresy continue. And then, right behind him in August, a new governor also arrived, and he had Posadas back completely. By November, the ban on Kachinas was put back into place. The masks and anything and everything associated with the Kachinas was to be collected. Church attendance was forced upon the Puebloans, And the laws which Mendizabal had written to ease the burden on the Indians were every one of them overturned. And obviously, I mean, Mendizabal was arrested and sent south to Mexico City to stand before the Inquisition. On his way to prison, he would say, Look, gentlemen, there is no longer God or king, since such a thing could happen to a man like me. No, no, there is no longer God or king. End quote. He would die in his cell, still waiting for a trial a year and a half later. With everything Mendizabal had done to help the Puebloans overturned, and the pendulum swinging wildly in the other direction, the stage was set for the people who had ever so briefly tasted sweet, sweet freedom to begin to fume at the repression that was again rained down upon them. One historian, who shares my last name, Carol Riley, Carol Riley would write that it was here the friars launched a, quote, Franciscan war on native religion, end quote. As if they hadn't been waging that war the entire time, honestly. But now they had ammunition. Despite the fact that the king of Spain outlawed slavery in his kingdom in the 1660s, the Puebloans and their neighbors would still suffer at the hands of the Spanish clergy and state from servitude and slave raids. Sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, these slave raids were the only way for these governors to get any sort of lasting financial or political worth out of the post of being assigned to New Mexico. Not that that justified it. And their great distance from Madrid and Mexico City made it a whole lot easier to get away with this evil, illegal stuff. In 
and on top of that, the governors were sometimes encouraging the Puebloans to do the raiding of slaves for themselves. Not only were slave raids allowed, but the kidnapping of children from Pueblos and the kidnapping of children from the Athabascans, both under false pretenses, of course, it was occurring enough for one Fray Alonso de Benavides to complain to the governor at the time that it was appalling that the Spanish were allowed to, quote, take Indian boys and girls from the Pueblos on the pretext that they are orphans and take them to serve permanently in houses of Spaniards where they remain as slaves, end quote. This had the obvious effect of angering the Athabascans, who would take it out on those Pueblos, especially the Pueblos which were furthest from Spanish control. Historically, the Puebloans would trade extensively with the nomadic tribes. They would trade for buffalo products or things beyond the Great Plains or even down into Mexico, or shells at the Pacific Ocean. They weren't always enemies, although they had their squabbles. The Apaches and Navajos would sometimes slip into Puebloan communities, I mean three or four at a time, and steal stuff in the dead of night. Sometimes they would be caught and one would be killed, and occasionally a group of 100 or more would come and make war on the Puebloans when it was felt someone had been wronged or to avenge the death of a loved one, say if they got caught stealing. Unfortunately, though, the Spanish fueled this occasional animosity and complicated the relationship. Part of this is because the Puebloans stopped having things to trade, because the Spanish took so much of the community's goods when they collected their tribute. Another part is the fact that the Puebloans now had metal, horses, and other exotic shiny things like grains and goods introduced by the Spanish, which were just an incredibly appealing target for raids and theft. And then there's the Spanish counter-raids and theft of people themselves. At first, the Spanish kept the nomadic Indians at bay, but pretty quickly into the occupation, like very quickly. Their defensive influence waned. Although they'd still lead war parties against the nomadic tribes as punishment for their encroachment. After all, the Spanish were also there to defend the Puebloans, not just take their stuff and baptize them. And honestly, if Apache raiders took off with a bunch of loot, that's less loot for the Spanish. Despite that occasional protection, as the revolt approached, the Navajo, Apaches, and Comanches were all stepping up the number and severity of their raids against the Puebloans. In 1677, the largest influx of people into the territory since Onyate's reinforcements, which remember how that ended, they ultimately left shortly after their arrival, but the largest influx of newcomers to the territory happened in that year of 1677. At that time, 43 new soldiers arrived fresh from Mexico. Granted, 40 of them were in chains, and they were all, con well, those 40 were convicted criminals who were only there as soldiers to serve out their punishments. What could possibly go wrong there? That occasional protection by the Spanish soldiers, though, would actually see the Puebloans and the Spanish fight side by side against their, sometimes, nomadic enemies. Which meant, although the Native Americans weren't allowed to use the horses or the arquebuses, they were certainly learning how to use them. I mean, in reality, they had to have known how to use an arquebus, because they shot that fray at Zuni Pueblo. Roberts says this in Pueblo Revolt of the side-by-side -side fighting. Quote, through close observation, the canny war captains learned much about European styles of warfare. Unwittingly, the Spanish were training the fighting force that would soon turn against them. End quote. And the turning was quickly approaching. Things were somehow getting even more bleak in the land of enchantment for the Puebloans. And this Catholic religion with all its sermons and praying and bells and the governors with their pendulum-swinging laws, they weren't fixing the problems that beset the Puebloans on all sides. The rain wasn't coming, so the corn wasn't growing. The epidemics 
mostly smallpox, with a second one popping up in 1671, the epidemics continue destroying and killing and inflicting death at a scale we can thankfully only wonder at. Despite the passing of laws, the slave raids from the Spanish down south had returned, and the violent raids from the northern Indians of the Apache and Navajos, they had intensified, partly in reaction to these slave raids. These raids, especially from the Apache, coupled with the drought that was going on for five years in the 1670s, and the starvation, just massive starvation, all of that would eventually force entire villages, six pueblos, at least six pueblos, probably more, but six pueblos in one year were abandoned in some parts of New Mexico. I'm mostly talking about the Salinas Pueblo and the surrounding region. I've been to the Salinas Pueblo uh, over a decade ago, and it's a place that's rarely visited by travelers, but it does sport some awesome ruins and some very unique history when it comes to the Spanish and the Puebloans. I'm getting only a little off topic here, but it seems like the Spanish did not build their church on top of the Kiva at Salinas, but rather next door. And it seems like the two peoples, the Spaniard colonists and the Puebloans, got along a lot better than they did up north, probably due to their being cut off and a little down south. In the greater context of the entirety of New Mexico, though, those Salinas Pueblos weren't as cut off from Santa Fe as Santa Fe was cut off from New Spain. The Indians, especially Apaches, after years of raids down south, they had gotten great at riding horses and attacks on convoys between the two major Spanish centers forced the convoys to slow down and occasionally stop coming altogether. Bureaucratic nightmares also ensued when various peoples along that convoy route from New Spain to Santa Fe, which is known as the Camino Real, but the landowners along the route, Camino Real, argued who even owned the major and only artery that led to Santa Fe. Also, not says of the 750 mile stretch from northern Mexico to Santa Fe that it, quote, passed through territory reputed to be some of the most forbidding in the New World. End quote. Unpredictable waters that could flood or be completely dried up. A 90 mile journey through incredibly dangerous desert, deep and dry arroyos, rugged and sharp mountains, high winds, sandstorms, thunderstorms, hailstorms, snowstorms, torrential rains, wild and steep mesas, wild animals, wild plants, wild peoples. It made the journey to that land of entrapment all the more difficult and unpleasant and seemingly impossible. Unless you went in large, heavily armed, and expensive convoys. And asking for the men, weapons, and money to make the trek became increasingly difficult as time wore on for the colony. Not to mention the Apaches were becoming increasingly warring and violent against the Puebloans and Spaniards in New Mexico. They began to strangle the territory. I know I brought up the Apaches a lot, but they truly were strangling the territory. In 1669, Efray Juan Bernal would write, quote, The land is at war with the widespread heathen nation of the Apache Indians, who kill all the Christian Indians they can find and encounter. No road is safe. Everyone travels at risk of his life, for the heathen traverse them all, being courageous and brave, and they hurl themselves at danger like people who know no God, nor that there is any hell. End quote. The Apache even burned down that Zuni Pueblo I mentioned at the beginning that had been around since forever, the Pueblo of Hawika. They burned it and the church down and carried away a thousand people and all their livestock. Down south of Albuquerque in those pueblos I just mentioned, the Salinas Pueblos, at one of them, Abo, the Apaches killed many inhabitants and the friar, but not before stripping him naked, flogging him, beating him horribly around the head until he died, 
Then they surrounded his dead body with a circle of slaughtered white lambs. By this point, and going forward, starvation, disease, distrust, and every other thing mentioned previously had dwindled the number of defenders of the land, and especially of each pueblo, to a near useless number. This is also why so many less pueblos existed 80 years after the Spanish arrived. They were continuously gathering together out of necessity. Gathering together and gathering either south near El Paso, out of the territory and closer to New Spain, or closer to Santa Fe and to the Spanish settlers. Meanwhile, the entire land was growing more and more isolated from New Spain. This Increased isolation would shatter Oñate's dream of keeping the Puebloans and the settlers separate. And by 1670, the line between the two had been so blurred that the coming revolt would truly be a civil war affair. By that time, there were barely any Spaniards who weren't mixed. Even still, these blurred lines weren't necessarily a good thing for the Puebloans, who would continue to suffer. Not just from the Spanish, but also from their fellow Puebloans, who were slowly siding with the Spanish. At this late of a date before the revolt, quite a few rebellions were planned, but none were completed or really even got started. Some plans died because of antipathy by the Puebloans close to the Spanish. Others died when they were ratted out by those same Indians close to the Spaniards. So for many Puebloans, it was time for a change. And it was time to get these Catholics and Spaniards out of their lands that they'd inhabited since at least the end of the Anasazi Civil War. But obviously, for some of the Puebloans, for much, much longer than that. Their numbers, though, were dwindling. According to Roberts, quote, in the course of the 130 years since Coronado's Entrada, the total Puebloan population had been reduced by more than 75%, from an estimated 80,000 to less than 20,000. That is just a heartbreaking number. And it's so high uh, due to the same malice that wiped out most of the entire hemisphere, that unstoppable and evil force of disease. So the shamans and religious leaders did the only thing they knew to do, and they began putting hexes and curses on the robed foreigners in the hopes of their swift demise. As Roberts puts it, quote, It is not perhaps going too far to see New Mexico in the 1670s as a colony gone collectively mad. End quote. Five years before the revolt, though, in 1675, after the curses were placed and the seething anger was almost at an eruption point, after the people had suffered tremendously and were still continuing to suffer, the last domino fell when Governor Juan Francisco Trevino ordered that all kivas in the land be destroyed. He also issued a zero-tolerance policy on all native religions, practices, and the Kachinas. After that, he rounded up a whole bunch of malcontents and miscreants after it was discovered that four friars had had hexes placed on them. And more egregiously, after seven friars and three Spaniards had been murdered at the Tewa Pueblos. Because of the murders and the witchcraft... The remaining friars scoured the countryside and gathered every idol, kachina, powder, and feather they could find. Anything related at all to the Puebloan's traditional life was rounded up for burning. At the same time, 47 Puebloan quote-unquote sorcerers were rounded up and taken to Santa Fe for trial. Four of these men were sentenced to death by hanging, and the sentence was carried out although one of them had already hanged himself. The other 43 were given various sentences of either imprisonment, servitude, flogging, or most likely all three. This, though, was simply too much after such a troubling time for the Puebloans to bear. And the largest amassing of Native Americans against Santa Fe, probably up to this point 
period. The angry Puebloans marched in mass to the capital. On the way there, they left many reinforcements hidden in the hills around the town, before 70 armed and angry warriors descended on the governor's own quarters. They were completely intent on killing him if he did not free their holy men prisoners that the Spanish were punishing as sorcerers. And they made that very clear. Kessel, in Kiva Cross and Crown, says this of the incident. Sensing the mood of these uninvited guests, Trevino accepted their eggs and other offerings, gave them some woolen blankets, and reportedly said about the prisoners lamely, quote, Wait a while, children. I will give them to you and pardon them, on condition that you forsake idolatry and iniquity. End quote. In the end, he would indeed give the imprisoned men back over to the Puebloans, who now believed and held a little hope that a rebellion could actually succeed. Force had yet again proven effective. But one man in particular, a man who had just been arrested, flogged, and then released, that one man was going to make the entire revolt an actual reality, and not just a hope. Roberts says of this man, quote, His very name, as far as we can judge, unknown to any Spaniard. Pope, a shaman from San Juan Pueblo, some 45 years old, returned to his home and began to brood on the vision that had been forming in his mind even before the flogging he had publicly endured. End quote. Next time, the revolt will erupt. The Spanish will be kicked out. The Puebloans will be free. But life under Pope won't be quite as rosy as advertised. And ultimately, the Reconquista will occur and the whole dance will begin anew. So, stay tuned, and I'll be seeing you again soon in the American Southwest. <laughs>